Hi, good morning, everyone. So we are just going to begin. So if you could take a seat, that would be great. Good morning, everyone. So welcome to this session on improving access to finance for digital entrepreneurs in Africa. I believe this is among the most important issues for Africa to take full advantage of the evolving digital economy. This is what we heard for the last three days, actually, the how important financing. People have ideas. People can work with whatever the connectivity they have. But the young entrepreneurs, the, the power in this region, you know, was telling, were telling us it's the financing. It's the, it's the, it's the big uh, constraint here. So my name is Shamika Siriman, and I am the director of the Division on Technology and Logistics of Angtad. And it is my division that, uh, you know, puts this show. So this session, um, I would want to let you know that the, the, the session is broadcast live on the web, so I wish to bid welcome also to those of you who are following the discussion remotely. There are several of them I hear. The session will also be simultaneously interpreted uh, in French and English, so anyone who wishes to ask questions or make comments can do so in any of the two languages. So as I mentioned earlier, this session will focus on the need to facilitate a robust financial architecture here in Africa that can fund innovation and entrepreneurship at all points across the e-commerce value chain. In spite of progress, we also heard many, you know, many, many places there's a lot of progress. Several African countries, however, do not provide reliable financial services or early stage capital debt to startups and growth-oriented businesses in the e-commerce ecosystem. And to take the full advantage of digitalization, financing, and other services are needed to support entrepreneurs seeking to develop innovative solutions and new business models. And that's what we heard for the last three days from the 700-plus private sector uh, enterprises, entrepreneurs that were presented here, and some of you are already here. And we also heard that the digital entrepreneurs in Africa often struggle to get the same access to finance as their counterparts in other parts of the world, especially in Asia. You know, we also work in other parts of the world, and we see that gap. So the concern is that this is going to increase the risk of widening divides in the digital economy. So that's why we are here. With this help of this very eminent group of experts, we will this morning, do a few things. We will review the current status of access to finance for digital entrepreneurs for Africa, take stock, and with your help too, and look at existing barriers, especially with your help and with all of us here. Discuss the role of the financial sector, including banks and venture capital firms, and look at the potential role of various tech hubs and incubators and we have some of them already here in the panel. They have an amazing experience of taking tech hubs and incubators forward. And finally, we will also discuss the most important policy measures that should be taken, both in individual countries and internationally, to improve the situation. You know, we at Angtad are, you know, we are an organization that does a lot of policy, and we will take these recommendations on board very seriously. And we, as you know, this is a, this uh, e-commerce week is done with our e-trade for all partners. They're all international organizations working in this field, providing technical cooperation, advisory services, 
uh, funding for projects and so forth. The recommendations that come from here, we will also bring to them and to the donors, to the EU, other development partners, and so forth. Because I find that this is one of the most important sessions that we are now tackling now, the financing issues. So now, I don't think we can have a better group of panelists than our panelists here and the one there. So let me give me the brief introduction of the panelists because they really have done this stuff. So they know what they're talking about when it comes to financing. So Mr. Francois Coupian is the digital manager of the UN Capital Development Funds. Francois is based in Kampala, Uganda. Francois, can you please put your hand up? Okay, he's on that. Okay, okay. that's fine. That's... Thank you, Francois. Mr. Nick Williams heads the ICT division of the African Development Bank, and Nick is based in Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire. Nick, there. And uh, Catherine is on that side. Yeah. Ms. Catherine Collin is the head of regional representation for East Africa at the European Investment Bank, and Catherine is working out of Nairobi, and Catherine is there. And I have Mr. Tim Kelly, is lead ICT policy specialist, transport and ICT in the World Bank Group, and he's also based here in Nairobi. Tim. And I have, I have Andrieta Muforo, is partner of Telcom Capital, which has offices in Nairobi and Lagos. Andrieta works out of the Nairobi office. Andreas is right next to me. And I have Ms. Amolo Ueno, is East Africa Regional Director at BFA. Amolo heads up the Nairobi office while also leading the Finance for Life area of expertise, focusing on financial services, addressing development areas such as health and education. Amolo is there on my right-hand right side. And now to Mr. Simunsa. Muyangana is the co-founder and director of entrepreneurship at Bongo Hive, an innovation and technology hub in Lusaka, Zambia. And I think I have had time to talk with uh, Simonsa. And you know, this is a, this is a, one of the best uh, tech hub experiences. So, on my left, and Mr. Sam Chapate is the managing director of Jumia Kenya. Sam is there. And Mr. Eugene Niam, Niam Unga is general counsel at Retail Pay, a relative newcomer to the digital economy here in uh, Kenya. I was just talking to him, and it was really a great idea uh, of how a startup has, uh, you know, begun with a really neat idea. So we are all here. So many thanks for all of you for participating in this session. I know it was raining, so it's kind of a bit difficult to get here, but you're all here now. So it is my intention now to manage the discussion in an interactive, we need to be interactive as much as possible so we can cover as much ground as possible. And as you can see, we have an amazing mix of expertise in this panel and you cannot have a better um, uh, a group of expertise to talk about financing uh, of the, in the e-commerce space than the panelists we have here. And I am aware that there is a wealth of knowledge and experience also in the audience. This is what we heard for the last three Days, there were amazing you know, discussions, ideas coming from the audience. So I will encourage all panelists to be you know, concise and short in your interventions so that we leave enough time for interactions with the floor. So now we will go through the parts of this discussion. The first, we start the current status of access to finance for digital entrepreneurs. So let me now get to Andrieta to ask about your perspective on this. And also please tell us a bit of how Telcom Capital you know, comes into this picture, because you have lots of experience. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we run a venture capital fund uh, called TLCom. So we've been historically investing in Europe and Israel, and over the last couple of years, uh, made some investments in African uh, tech companies. Um, so this was, and back in 20, 2013, we decided to launch a fund to invest in tech-enabled businesses across the Africa continent, having realized that there's enough uh, deal flow for one to actually launch a fund and make, uh, make significant investments and support African tech entrepreneurs. 
uh, we managed to close our fund, um, which, which I think also speaks to the, the state of financing. So even just on a, on a fund level, for us it took us, it took us three years to raise the fund. Uh, so in many respects, we were a little bit ahead of our time in terms of the, um, when, you when you talk to investors who invest in funds. But we managed to raise a $40 million fund, uh, and we'll, we'll close at a, at a higher amount uh, next year. And uh, we have offices in uh, Kenya, Nairobi, uh, and then also in Lagos. Uh, Nigeria, and then also in London. And we invest in early to growth stage uh, tech-enabled businesses across sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we're typical C uh, Series A investor, so we don't do seed, but we come when there's this traction and a product and a product market fit has been established. Uh, since our first close, we've invested in five companies, of which uh, two are in... Um, Two are in Kenya and three are in Nigeria, and we're continuing to, to, deploy, technology, uh, to deploy funds uh, to high-quality African entrepreneurs. And, um, yeah, so, so that's it in terms of uh, a brief on our, on our fund. Um, actually, so maybe I think I should also talk about the type of investors that we managed to, to bring on board, uh, which was, uh, so we have the Africa Development Bank, the European Investment Bank, and Propaco, our current investors. And then we also have uh, high net worth individuals from Silicon Valley and from Europe. Uh, and then to move to the state of financing for, for, for African entrepreneurs, um, our, our sense is that it's, it's very little uh, in terms of what's available. So you have to look also across the ecosystem. So from angel to uh, angel seed uh, investments to venture capital. So within our sense is within the the half a million to to five five six million dollars. There's actually a lack of capital in that space. Uh, in in the in the angel and the the early the, the seed stage, you may, entrepreneurs can you know try get money from family or friends and do business plan competitions. I mean that's still also an area that needs to be cultivated, uh, because what you find is that in Africa most people are not investing in in tech. They're investing in uh, real estate. They're buying you know houses, apartments, uh, infrastructure. The thought of technology and venture capital just the perception of high risk is. Um, Kind of is blocks them, which also is a challenge that we faced when we were fundraising because what you find is um, if you think about the asset class as venture capital, people will do infrastructure, real estate, private equity before they think about uh, venture capital. And then now if you think on the geography scale, they'll do U.S., Europe, uh, Israel, China, India before they think about Africa. So we, our asset class proved to be fairly unpopular, but what's happening is that um, I think African uh, investors are, are seeing the opportunity and seeing the real role that technology plays uh, if you think about youth employment uh, and creating uh, some of the large businesses of the future and taking advantage of the digital, um, digital revolution that's happening. Andreta, can I ask you, because you said three years it took you to raise funds. Mm -hmm. How did you tip it? You have raised successfully $40 million fund. What was that thing that got you going? What was your success story? I, I really wish I had the, the, the answer to this. I think, I think a couple of things. I think um, so the high net worth individuals who are in our, in our fund, they invested fairly early. We always had the European Investment Bank as a supporter, but they could never come in alone as a DFI. So what we needed was the other development finance institutions to come on board, but many of them have never done a venture capital, they've never invested in a venture capital fund. So, so it took, in, in fact, the thing that really triggered it was the Boost Africa initiative that the EIB and Africa Development Bank uh, launched. And uh, through that initiative, we were the first investment uh, that, 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 uh, that they made. So I think a realization was made that they need, they need, we need to do more within the technology space uh, within, and supporting entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs. And then they remembered, oh, there's a group of four people going around Africa <laughs> looking for capital. Um, and, and I think that's part of, uh, I think it's, it was more the investment com, uh, investor com, uh, community caught up with uh, the opportunity that we were seeing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Let me now turn to Amolo. Amolo, 
just to pick up from something Andreata mentioned about the angels, the early seeds, of the adventures, and the, the role of friends and family investment. Could you please take us through that? And also, what about the lack of growth, cap, growth in capital? I mean, because you have lots of experience in this space. Um, so my company, uh, BFA, we're a consulting firm uh, that specializes in digital uh, financial services, especially for the low income end of the market. So the comments I'm going to make are really not about the, uh, the type of investor, I think that the investment opportunity that and Andrietta has talked about, but actually the tens if not hundreds of thousands of micro entrepreneurs who are trying to um, develop their business through e-commerce and online selling. Um, but the story is not really that different. It's just the scale that's different. So uh, we've done some research in e-commerce micro-entrepreneurs in uh, Tanzania, Kenya, and Ghana, and we find that just as with the larger uh, or more ambitious larger digital entrepreneurs, the first place that people get money to start their business is indeed friends and family. Uh, and then they go online. Mostly the, the, the average micro-entrepreneur seller in Africa is using uh, platforms like WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook to market and sell their products. Um, and what we've seen, which is very interesting, is that they tend to reach a bottleneck. So from their, their perspective, when they go online, the market is essentially unlimited they could sell as much as they could possibly produce. Um, but they run into uh, bottlenecks of being able to manage the online world. So partially they have trouble just handling all of the customer service, messaging and communications, dealing with the customers all the time. They find this very oppressive. Um, but then they also lack capital to grow. So there's a micro-entrepreneur, which I think is a target of a lot of um, government policy and government ambition is to turn these micro-entrepreneurs into the drivers of the future economy. And they're stuck in their micro-size um, because they've run out of the ability of their friends and family network to support them to grow. So um, I don't think we're going to see international angel investors coming in at that level. I think it's a challenge to uh, digital finance as a, as a community to come up with new products that work well for that micro-enterprise size. Uh, I think some of the banks are starting to offer products that maybe when you're just a little bit bigger and you have three or five employees and maybe a five or $10,000 a month turnover, that the banks are starting to offer products that make sense at that market. Um, but I think we, there is a big challenge to meet this initial growth from getting over that friends and family hurdle, getting out of being a single, single uh, sole proprietorship, moving into having a few employees and a, and a bit more of a structured uh, or formalized work environment. So I think that's a major challenge, um, and it's going to be a major challenge if digital commerce is going to deliver on the, the growth ambitions that we all presumably have for it. Thank you, Amoru. This is a very, very good point. So let me now turn to Nick, because Nick, you have heard two stories. La Andrietta's story about you know, good size uh, fund being launched, and we also heard from Amolo. <laughs> it's just uh, that the lower end, it's the micro enterprises. You know, they want to grow, they have an idea, they have the ability to sell, but they, do, they are constrained by capital. So how does the uh, African Development Bank handle these issues across the region? What are your experiences? Okay, thanks, uh, and it's lovely to be here on the panel this morning. Um, just, you know, the bank itself isn't really positioned to de invest directly into many of the ventures that we're talking about at the moment, uh, seed stage, growth stage businesses. Um, so what we do is we channel money through uh, players who are um, uh, positioned to, to, to address the market, to get out and meet the, the thousands of entrepreneurs that are out there and to make those investments. Hence the investment, for example, in, in TLCOM's Tide Fund. We've recently um, put 7 million euros into uh, Partex Fund out of uh, West Africa as well. So, so we do manage to hit um, indirectly many, many um, 
ventures. Um, but they're more at the, that, that level where they're asking for about a million bucks a pop. Um, now, what the bank is trying to do um, directly is to encourage the creation of an environment where um, entrepreneurs can flourish and that they're not hampered by the ecosystem in which they're operating. Uh, and we, we, we sort of see four, four quadrants to, to that problem. One is connectivity. In the end, you need some kind of big fat pipe that allows for data and allows you to set, you know, you do digital things. And it, frankly, Africa's not in a bad place there. We've got a lot of undersea cables. We've got improving terrestrial fiber. Metro fiber, mm, it's not always as great as it could be. There, there, there's issues there. But you know, we, we've managed, for example, as a bank even to, to, to move funding along with the EU for um, Central Africa Republic. So they're, they're one of the last countries without access to an undersea cable. They will have access to two undersea cables via Congo and um, via Cameroon in due course. So the connectivity story, I think, is getting resolved and is getting resolved quickly. Um, and in places like Lag Lagos, um, Kenya, Joburg, it's not really a fundamental problem. The other th second at the quadrant I see is, well, where's the focus? Where, where do we all meet? Where do we have those serendipitous meetings that, through which young entrepreneurs can have cracking ideas and find people who can support them? Um, there's sort of two routes around it. Here we are in Kenya. We see a, mo a more dynamic hub of, uh, developing uh, down the Ngong Road. For some countries, that isn't the case. I mean, we, we invested $70 million in the Damniadio corridor outside Dakar to create a technology park with the aim that that will provide some sort of focal point with um, access to a big fat pipe, with access to uh, spaces for, for incubators, uh, for hubs, the uh, hub to develop, a research, research uh, uh, center, training center, access to a data center, things that people need access to in order to take forward their ideas without them actually you know, being a direct investment into their businesses themselves. So we'll carry on doing that. I think um, Tim will talk about, I think, some of the, the, the hub issues. And I think, you know, jury's out on what, what models actually work and what, what's most efficient. But, you know, uh, the more we try things, the more we learn. Um, so, so we're doing, doing um, stuff around that area. Um, the third quadrant I would push is academia and skills. And there's two aspects to that. There's the, the academic, which is academia is very good at coming up with cracking ideas. Um, because that other people can't because they're not making a profit. And they, they, they're just sitting there thinking hard thoughts in a dark room with a cold, wet towel over their forehead, and voila, they come up with something that's kind of brilliant, but they don't know how to commercialize it. So that linkage between academia and, and, and hubs and the, the entrepreneurs, they're able to take that forward and, and, and make a run at it on a commercial basis. And we, you know, as a bank, we, we, we finance the Carnegie Mellon ICT Center of Excellence in Rwanda. But you, know, you see around the world, you know, there's the Cambridge Fen in the UK, there's, there's Stanford and Caltech in the, in the West Coast. You need, I think, some kind of linkage in, to, to academia. And, and to be honest, that's still relatively underdeveloped in, in Africa. We do have it around Vitvatisrand, um, and we do have it a bit in Cape Town. But we don't have many of those centers of excellence. And that's reflecting, I think, on the second aspect of the same quadrant, which is our skills. Um, we have a lot of young people who have entrepreneurial ideas, but they don't necessarily have either the entrepreneurial skills to take them forward or the computing coding skills to take them forward. So the bank's uh, got its own coding, um, coding for employment program that looks to uh, uh, create 234,000 um, coders in Africa by 2026 and 130 centers of excellence for coding by 2026. Um, uh, the reality is we need more skills than just coding, though. We know that. We need to find a model 
that allows people to, to, to develop their entrepreneurial skills. And we look to places like India where they have the double ITs and the triple ITs where they bring together technology training alongside entrepreneurial business development training. And I think that's a model that, that Africa needs to reflect upon. We're certainly doing so in the bank, trying to just determine what the curriculum would be that would allow, allow a, a, a young, young African to actually bring forward his, his or her own idea. Um, but that's a real, real work in, in progress area. Um, but we're, you know, fundamentally, we've got, we've got to crack it. We've got a ton of youth who have, have ideas, who need employment. We've got an employment problem on the continent. We need to ensure that these guys and girls have the ability to take forward their ideas. And um, lastly, the last quadrant, I'd say, is this basic access to finance point. Uh, which we're here about today. But I think, you know, the fundamental point is if you don't have the other three quadrants right, where's the attraction for finance? So we've got to look at, it, at creating a holistic environment in which we can encourage entrepreneurs. And in doing so, uh, hopefully we can move finance away from its current focus on Lagos, Joburg, and Nairobi. They're, becoming, they're dragging in most of the finance here. We had a run at, in Rwanda where we given the, 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 a loan to the government so it could support the development of a, a fund in its own country there. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to see how that story develops because we might be wishing on a star to, to assume that every country is going to have an ICT, um, you know, access, a real sector that's entrepreneurial and digitally transformative. It may be that we're in Africa, as we see in other other continents, certain places win and certain places don't. Um, and I, my encouragement there is to say, think about what your comparative advantage is. Is it in agriculture? Well, let's focus on agri-tech, for example. So we, we've got those pieces that uh, hopefully will lead into some of the, um, the pipeline um, for, for Andreata in the future, and hopefully she'll be investing in more than just um, Kenya and Nigeria, and I'm sure she will. But it's, it's an indicative that it's a story still, still developing. Um, lastly, if I may, just very briefly, because God knows you don't want to hear me for very long, there are other key enablers we still need to put out there. We still need proper data regulation so that it's quite clear what ru rules apply around digital. We still need to embed ID and the, the digital ID linked to, to finance and, and access to, to banking so that we can commercialize and monetize our stuff. And that's been, I think, an issue in the past in, in Zambia. Um, we still need to improve access to devices beyond just a phone to laptops so that people can actually do the inputting required to, to, to create some of these things. Um, but that's it. Uh, enough from me. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. That's a lot from you. I think uh, it, 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 it takes, you know, but these are the issues that we need to discuss here. So this is very good that you put it, you know, you summarize all the big issues facing the region, you know, with your work in African Development Bank. So let me now continue with this discussion about the main barriers facing digital entrepreneurs. Francois, I saw you nodding your head, so could you please come and tell us from the UN Capital Development Fund in Africa, what do you see as the main barriers and what are the lessons that you bring to this table? Okay, thank, thank you, Shamika. So, good morning, everyone. I think it's a great pleasure to be with all of you uh, this morning. So let me just explain rapidly what is uh, the United Nations Capital Development Fund, because I'm sure that most of you doesn't know what is UNCDF. So we are one of the UN agencies, and within our programs, we are focusing in 20 countries about increasing access to digital finance and also increased digital economies. So what do we have? We have a team of digital finance experts coming from the private sectors that are working on a daily basis with the private sectors, but also with the government in order to remove the key barriers, in order to accelerate the development of a digital finance ecosystem. So what are we doing on a daily basis? We are working with the central banks in order to make sure that we have the right policy and regulation. We are working with mobile network operators in order to increase network coverage, in order to increase access to mobile phone. Then we are working with uh, different providers that could be uh, microfinance, bank, uh, mobile network operators, and now more and more entrepreneurs and small companies, and we'll be coming to that, 
in order to really to increase competition on the market and having more and more services that are tailored to be able to focus on the low income people. We are working also in increasing what we call last mile distribution. So I think technology is really great, but I think, I think it's all really important to make sure that there is an access, for example, for digital finance to be able to, to transfer cash to digital. And so what I call last mile distribution is an agent network. Uh, we're also working with the government and private company in order to make sure that more and more payments are flowing in the system to make it viable and sustainable for the private sectors. And last but not least, we are working with from a client perspective, just to make sure that the right product and service are developed and that they have the right level of knowledge and a financial and digital literacy to be able to properly use it. So recently also what we see one of the main challenges in the market was innovation, the lack of innovation in different markets, because most of the traditional providers that we have been working with are coming, I would say, with a one-size-fits-all approach. So a, that's a product and service that they need to, to bring to large scale. So that's why we have been, uh, since the last two years, we are working also a lot, of, a lot more in innovation and with partners like Bongo Hive in Zambia, but also Innovation Hub in Uganda, in order really to be able to tailor and starting developing, let's say, the future service that will really change the life of what we call the vulnerable segment. So we are working, focusing mainly on the women, youth, farmers, refugee, migrants, and MSMEs. So by working so with the different startup company and entrepreneurs, so we, we, we have what we call an innovation journey. And so we are really starting from the beginning, so ID phase. So someone's coming to, for example, an innovation lab, coming, yes, I have a great ID. So we help them turning this ID into a concept. So what is a concept is, is really to try to see from a market's perspective how this ID can be turned in a business that makes sense, to analyze the competition, to analyze the business model, to analyze what should be the partnership this entrepreneur should do in order to be able to launch his solution with the objective to turn this concept in what we call a minimal viable product, so it's something that you can go in the field and test it, and then if it's successful, to go the step further to build a company and then to scale the company. So through this whole journey with the entrepreneurs, I think there are a lot of challenges. And so we are working in the least developed countries, so where maybe also in terms of innovation, maybe we have the less development in terms of innovation. So the first one of the first key challenges beyond the finance part, and I will come to the finance part, is uh, concerning the team capacity. All right? So mainly what we have, we have a person with really good ID coming maybe with the ICT background or financial background. I think what is important for an ID to be successful is to have, uh, let's say, several players, several uh, persons that can work together in order to bring the right expertise to be able to develop this on a bigger way. So, then I, I will come back also the solution we are bringing to that. The second part, I think also a lot of uh, ideas are not going beyond the ID stage, is also there is limited exit strategy, I think, for innovation in Africa. And so what I mean that is, what, how can we offer to these entrepreneurs some first exit strategy? I give you some example of what we are doing in different countries, and mainly I think they're the private sectors of the government that play role, a key role to play. So what we are trying, to, with our partnership with the private sectors, for example, we are working with a lot of different agro-processors in uh, Uganda, in different countries. So it's big companies. I think one of the challenge is to bring innovation in the company. On the other side, we have the entrepreneurs coming with great ideas. So we are making the link. And I give you an example for an agro-processor in Uganda. One of his key, his key challenge and what he would like to solve in the short term is how he can increase loyalty of farmers in order to make sure that when he's selling seeds to some of the farmers, they're not selling it back to someone else, but they're selling the, uh, the crops to, to this agro-processor. So what we are doing is that we have organized a challenge with, on this topic making sure we crowd ideas with some entrepreneurs and giving these entrepreneurs, the best entrepreneurs, the opportunity to test in the field and with these this agro-processors the ideas. And I think the exit strategy, I think the first client for these entrepreneurs can become this, uh, this company. And I think that's something, I think it's key because a lot of ideas are not be going beyond the ID stage because honestly there is no exit strategy for, uh, exit strategy for them. Um, 
the, the, another key challenge I think faced by entrepreneurs is they don't have a lot of tools to be able to better innovate. And I think one of the first part is concerning, I call that the digital rails. How do we make sure that there is enough phones, all people have access to their phone, and also they can easily, as an entrepreneur, have access to open API and have access to data so they can really leverage, let's say, the digital infrastructure that is in place to grow their market and to grow their ID. Uh, I think also the industry is changing, I would say, rapidly in different countries. For example, MTN in Uganda recently launched Open API on their data system and on, on their uh, payment system. So making, I think, available to all entrepreneur and startup company a way to easily plug in a payment solution to be able that they can uh, develop their business and make money from their business. So I think that's a great opportunity. Um, what is missing is also access to data. I think a lot of digital innovation are leveraging data. I think in most of markets, access to data is a major challenge. And so that's something also we are trying to work with some of the different providers in the country where we are present in order to see how step by step we can provide, let's say, data sets in order to test this. But also in the future, why don't have, let's say, open API on data, so just to make sure that they can leverage this on a, on a, uh, on a longer basis. Concerning financial support, so that's one of the key parts of the, I think, finance support is lacking at all stages, from ID, concept, more, uh, MVP, and then uh, scale. And a lot of ID are not going beyond the ID stage because maybe some entrepreneurs are just lacking maybe less than $1,000 to be able to go to the next step. And so that's really small, small financing we are talking about. And so what we have done, so in some of the challenge that we have been doing, either we were supporting the best ID to be able to travel to the field, to test this to the field, and really going from the ID to the concept stage and be able to test this concept in the, real, uh, in the reality. So that's the uh, first part. Um, then I think there is more money that is required to build the MVP and then to scale. But I think I would, I would really would like to make sure that from in this discussion also we start from the ID stage where it's really small amount of money for several entrepreneurs in order to make sure by step by step you can filter all this ID to come up with the best, the best example. Um, and I think also one of the key barriers it's for the entrepreneurs maybe is the size of the markets that we have in Africa. I think all markets, I think we're small, I think especially in the market where we are working in the least developed countries, what is really important also for, for the entrepreneurs is being able to have more regional or global exposure of the ID, just to make sure that they do not focus only on one country, but they have the ability to, to do that in, in several countries. And that's why I think the role of the innovation lab like uh, Bongo Hive is also, I think they have several regional partnerships to make sure that entrepreneur can go just, just behind one country, but to be able to test that in different countries. So I will, I will pause here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francois. Uh, Catherine, I'm coming to you because we want to get the EIB uh, perspective, but let me go to Bongo Hive because you were talking about, uh, Francois was talking about the whole innovation journey from idea to a successful business venture, you know, all that, all the constraints along that way and how many partners need to be there. It's not just financing, entrepreneurial skills and all that. Now, Bongo Hive, Simon, sir, you have done it. Give us a bit on what was your innovation journey. All right, so um, the question we've asked ourselves when we started Bongo Hive initially was, okay, great, how do we help young people um, develop uh, IT skills that would help them uh, get into the industry? But in the process of doing that, we figured out that uh, there weren't enough jobs, and some of them in the end uh, wanted to explore ideas that they were developing and to find out whether they could uh, take those into the market. Uh, and in supporting them, what we ended up doing was developing a three-layer structure that helps people, um, if we go through the journey that uh, Francois has, for example, described, is how do people validate the idea that, they've, uh, that they come up with. So um, you, you wake up in the middle of the night with an idea and say, okay, great, this could be a, a, a great business opportunity, but then how do we actually know that, 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 that it could potentially become a business? So. 
uh, we, we take, we help, we help people with those ideas go through a three-week boot camp that, uh, that helps them explore what's the market size, what's the market opportunity, uh, is there demand for this service or product that, they, that, they, that, that, they're, that they're getting into. We see a lot of people, uh, we see a lot of people working at a point where they're looking at supply but not, but not inquiring whether there's actual demand for what it is that they want to supply into the market and, uh, and we try to help them uh, figure that out. And then ultimately, can they actually pull this off? This, they've got a good idea but can they actually pull it off? What are the skills they need to have on the team to be able to, they need to acquire or to, to put together? If it's one person, do they need other people on the team to be able to, to, to actually pull it off? And also what other resources do they need to be, be able to do that? Once people get to start that, we ask them to start to test that idea, and hopefully if, they, if there's, there's opportunity to turn that into a business, we invite them back into a, 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 third, a second tier, which is uh, an early stage um, customer. We help them get, uh, gain early stage customers. Uh, that help them to get revenue. Now, the case in particular in Zambia is that you do not have, you do not have um, investment at the level of uh, idea stage or a lot also at, a, at, at the very, very early stage. Uh, we think that there's a, we think that there's a, we estimate that there's a, there's a funding gap of between two, um, 20 to $250,000 in trying to help, uh, in trying to help businesses at that point try to grow to, to that point. But then again, when people find out that there's an opportunity for business, the question then becomes is can they start to have, are they ready to have, start to have conversations with the telecoms of this world? So for example, if telecom capital say that they're looking for traction, product, product market fit, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So in, uh, an investor readiness is the next level that we're now getting into. It's like how do we help people that are actually showing that there's, there's potential for growth to start getting, in, to, to start getting into that? to start getting into that space. But to address this, to, to address this uh, uh, 20 to $250,000 gap is we're now asking, also asking ourselves, is okay, great. Isn't it important for players who are at that level that are hand-holding early stage enterprises to also then uh, develop the capacity to be able to recognize potential deal flow for the bigger, for the bigger players and invest early to address this gap and then uh, participate. Um, uh, that helps push them towards the level where uh, organizations like uh, TIL, Com Capital can uh, then uh, find it uh, better to, uh, at, at a size that they, they would be willing to participate in. So in, in the process of doing so, we, 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 the services that we offer uh, include uh, a co-working space that reduces the, that reduces the cost for, for early stage enterprises to operate from. Because if they, especially if they're working in the digital space, um, a, lot of, a lot of why they need financing then comes around to access to data, access to, access to, to resources like where they're going to store or um, uh, build this platform that they're, that they're setting out. But a bulk, of their, a bulk of their cost then goes towards human resources. Mm -hmm. Is acquiring the correct skills to be able to grow this, to, 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 to build out this thing. And that's where, for example, traditional banking won't work because there, is no, there, re, there are no assets to attach uh, an investment to uh, for, in, in, in the digital space to say, okay, great, to securitize um, uh, loans uh, and, and things like that. So, so the questions then that we have to ask ourselves around is, okay, great, what are the different forms of finance vehicles that could address, that could address, uh, that could address uh, the growth of enterprises in there? Should we be looking at multiple, uh, multiple asset classes uh, that allow, for example, if uh, a hub or a structure like a hub was set up, would you invest in the infrastructure that allows them to do the core working space so that there's, there's physical infrastructure that is invested in that, that grows uh, in value over time? And then another layer of that fund then goes into, uh, into the entrepreneurs that are going to lease out uh, some of the properties uh, inside there. And, and other infrastructure that goes there, as opposed to pure, a pure fan that probably just goes straight to entrepreneurs. And also, some hubs are experimenting with, for example, with uh, revenue share structures. It's like, okay, great. If, if, early stage, if early stage enterprises are bootstrapping because there's no, in, there's no investment going into them very, very early, then can you work out with a structure that says, okay, great. If they make, if they make, if they start to get an early stage, early, sta early, early revenue, 
uh, over a couple of years, so three to five years, is there a percentage of that, 5%, for example, that can come back into supporting a hub or early stage finances into, into getting that money to, to come back over time? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Let me now turn to... Sorry. Let me now turn to Catherine. Thank you so much for these thoughts. You see, we talked about the, the early stage entrepreneurs, the gap in funding. It's a 250K gap. But then the no assets to secure loans. So there are these whole risks for investors and lenders. How does AIB address these issues, especially in this region? Yeah, thank you, Shamika. Good morning to, to everyone. Um, first of all, I would love to say that I'm the only non-expert in the digital area on this panel, so, <laughs> because I'm representing the European Investment Bank here in Nairobi, uh, covering all, all our activities, but maybe quickly um, uh, presenting to you what we do here in the region and in, in Africa in general. So. EIB, for those who don't know it, is the Bank of the European Union. We are owned by the 28, soon to be 27, member states of the European Union. Um, and, and we operate globally. I mean, EIB is probably most known uh, in Europe, where we have about 90% of our lending volume, which was last year around 79 billion euro going, and the rest is uh, spread around, uh, around the world. I mean, Africa is a focus for the EIB. It's actually one of the first regions outside the European Union where we started operating in, in, uh, in the 60s. So it's, it's a long journey that, that we have done. Um, and, and there are two main axes of our intervention. One of them is uh, the enablers, if, if, if we, I can put this this way, that means uh, supporting infrastructure. Infrastructure in, in key sector, uh, energy is a main sector, in, uh, our main sector here in the region, renewable energy especially, but also transport and increasingly so ICT. Uh, as a matter of fact, so that that's maybe where we are getting to the subject of of, uh, of today. So I think on that one, the infrastructure development, we can talk about digitalization, but one of the key is to ensure that uh, the data connectivity reach out to everybody and, and allows to really leapfrog the potential that there is uh, here on the continent and in the region. So, I mean, improving Data connectivity, improving affordability as well is an important element that we need to take into consideration. And that, that's maybe where we can support by developing reliable infrastructure. Uh, recently, we, we have, uh, just to give concrete example, we have provided a loan, corporate loans to uh, Telcom Kenya, uh, which is one of the operators here in Kenya. Uh, that will enable them to expand their capacity in, in mobile broadband, broadband network as well as, uh, as uh, optical fiber. And I think that was an important one because so to know Kenya, Kenya, we, most of us, we have a, a Safaricom <laughs> subscription. Uh, and, and I think it is important to support other operators so that possibly this will also benefit in terms of bringing cost down for the, for the consumers and, and, and the users. And the other one is, is a corporate loan as well that we did to bandwidth and cloud services group holding, uh, which uh, it's an interesting case because the day we signed the transaction, they opened a bottle of champagne and they said, thanks to this loan, we have now uh, graduated from a startup to being a, a small and medium enterprise. And I think that's, that's a, the kind of reward we would like to hear uh, when, when we sign transaction, because that means it, it has an importance for them. And these guys, what they are doing is actually deploying optical fiber uh, in East Africa uh, to reach out, uh, to enable a, an outreach, a greater outreach. Now, the other axis, and which is more related to what we are discussing here today, is access to finance. Um, in East Africa, we have developed a very substantial portfolio of lines of credit to banks that are there to support, and also to microfinance institutions, I have to say, that are there to support uh, loans to SME and micro, micro enterprises. I mean, these are um, traditional lines of credit 
but they are associated with a very important technical assistance program, which is five million for the region here, that actually support not only the banks in, their, in building their capacity and improving their skills in terms of risk assessments and uh, tackling issues like environment and social guidelines and standards, which are also quite relevant, but also even training small entrepreneurs uh, on the field and giving them the basic skills and helping them structure their transaction. So I think we are a bit a stage further than the idea that, that Francois was, was mentioning, but still it, it is an, an, a very important and we, we've seen that this program has, has been quite impactful in the region and, and uh, gets the full appreciation of, of our beneficiary. And then the other way is, um, as uh, Nick was mentioning earlier, so by investing, being an investor, and as Andreata was also mentioning to start with, being a core investor in funds. And I have to say personally that coming to this region where I've been for three years, I mean, this is where I see a, an, a, an immense impact. And for a structure like EIB, which is a big machinery based in Luxembourg, being able to channel our funds through uh, vehicles like uh, TL Comtide and other, which will have an outreach to the small entrepreneurs uh, and have an outreach to small entrepreneurs with a great, pot uh, great growth potential, because I think this is what we are looking at here. The, the growth potential that there is on the continent in, in that area. So this is an area where we are focusing quite a lot and this region is actually vi very dynamic. We are invested in a number of funds and indeed to get, together with the African Development Bank we launched this Boost Africa initiative about three or four years ago that really came up um, from the idea that Technology, there is a, a great appetite for technology on the continent, and I think Kenya is a very good example with M-Pesa, for instance, I mean, which is something we don't have in Europe, and I'm always very frustrated when I go back to Europe that I cannot pay with my phone. Um, and I think that that was the idea. I mean, there's a huge potential. It lets to try and do something to help it out. But indeed, you can't do it with traditional loans, uh, and also because a bank is risk averse by nature and I think we always have to accept this so we need to find ways to kind of mitigate the risk or reduce the risk so that it attracts uh, banks as well in the system because that's also where a lot of the money is and I think that's where you have the interest on what we call the blending where we try and mix loans with grants and there, that's, that's also the beauty of this blending, is that you try and leverage, actually, loans with the grant element. And so uh, Boost Africa is about this. It's about putting loans from institutions like EIB and the African Development Bank and combining them with grants so that we can actually mitigate the risk and take more risks than we would, what we would be doing uh, in, in normal circumstances. And so that's what has enabled us to invest in... Uh, TL come tight and hopefully other funds that we will be coming up and see how these funds can reach out to the to the to the, the entrepreneurs at a later stage and I think that's what I take from here as well I, I mean I heard Francois uh, talking about this whole idea is that we somehow we can complement each other in, in uh, we will not be able to solve all the problems, one another, but by combining these different instruments, then we can enable the, the, the successful deployment and entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. You mentioned the immense growth potential of this region, the dynamism that you see in Africa on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So let me now, this is a good place to invite Eugene. Uh, this is where I mean, I was so impressed to talk to Eugene about the, 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 the retail pay is the, the new digital platform that you have created and it's a really neat business model, connecting farmers directly to consumers, really you know, trying to get the maximum out of this technology. So tell me, or tell us, what are the issues that you have faced when you launch this new venture, especially when it comes to raising uh, financing? Um, <coughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, just like you've said, what we are trying to do is uh, we're deploying technology to digitalize trade. And our platforms seek to restructure value chains, eliminating uh, unnecessary brokers, 
who bring price arbitrage and the result we hope is to drive prices down, bring more competition and get more innovators employed. Um, the interesting challenge, and I agree both with Nick uh, and Francois when they say, and I think this is a point of introspection for techpreneurs, it's very difficult to find a real techpreneur, somebody who is very good in coding, uh, but also uh, business savvy. Uh, most people on the dark side, as we call them, either are not even able to make meetings, they're often introverts, um, and do not have a way to properly express their innovation in a business sense. Um, so what, what I see happen, especially in Kenya and in Africa, um, the first stages, concept uh, to, you know, just from an idea to a concept is never a big problem, uh, and part of it is because of our culture. In Africa, people tend to come together and contribute to one another to promote each other. Uh, but the classification, either as a startup or as an SME, brings itself a curse and this, by this I mean uh, it is almost as if if you're too small, you're not allowed to dream big. And, and so um, techpreneurs have that challenge of convincing financiers that they need so much funding for their big projects because, you know, there's first the risk, there's the question whether they can manage the finances because they lack the skills, managerial and entrepreneurial skills. Um, so I think there is a real gap in investment in the training and acquisition of these particular skills. And perhaps that is where uh, the suggestion of grants, for example, uh, uh, could, could come in handy, uh, where you have grants that are uh, given to specific institutions that can help develop some of the skills. And I'm uh, proud to, um, to state that we have recently just been appointed to benefit from such uh, a, a grant from the government of Sweden through SIDA, uh, who will be, uh, who have uh, joined our hands with uh, the FSD Kenya, a well-established um, institution that has held the hands of bigger companies like M-Pesa uh, of Safaricom. And because this is the problem when, when you have a brilliant idea, um, but you don't have the capital to take it to market, or the scale of finance required is so large and nobody has ever heard of you, then it's not easy to go to market. So I think this is one particular area where uh, there should be, there's need for focus. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eugene. Let me, I think, uh, Nick, you were mentioned several, by several panelists. Would you want to put a few ideas? about the what, what is holding back digital entrepreneurship in uh, Africa, I think you mentioned a few, and then we will open for the, we will open to the. Uh, yeah. Maybe you can start a couple of words and then we get to uh, what's other panelists. Okay, so, so the question is what's holding back entrepreneurs. Um, it's a difficult question because because there's no no one answer to it. I mean, people get hit by di different things. Um, from from our lim limited experience as a development bank, um, we do see that there's a fundamental um, a skills issue. I think on the continent, and, and it was well well said uh, just now um, by Eugene because we're not very good at coming together with a plethora of different skill sets and built, binding them into something that actually functionally works as a, as a management group. I think we're, we're led by one or two people and we hope to, to, to bring things forward. But um, I think we still have to develop that, that kind of business savvy uh, alongside the technical skills. I think that's where um, we need to get things right because People don't invest so much in the idea, they invest in the people. Do they buy the person who's sitting in front of them? Do they buy the management group? Because we understand the, 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 we understand Africa, we understand the potential of Africa, as we might understand Europe and the potential in Europe. But do we believe that the guys and girls sitting in front of us are gonna be able to deliver? 
and that's why the skills piece is so critically important to my mind. We can do all the rest about connectivity, about links to this, that, and the other. We can, you know, put banks in front of people. That's fine, but if we don't believe them, it ain't gonna work. Thanks. Very good point. I think this is coming through in the whole panel, the, the, the skills, you know, to sell an idea. This is so critical. So before Andreata, before I get to Amolo, before I get to you, let me ask uh, our two panelists who did not have time to say anything, but we will be coming back to you in the next round. Do you want to pitch in at this stage very shortly? Yeah, so, um, I mean, there are a number of things holding back uh, entrepreneurs in Africa. I think uh, we focused in particular today on the issue of finance, uh, and that will always be a constraint, particularly for startups and particularly for uh, companies that are looking to accelerate their business. Um, we, we've heard a lot of very promising solutions as to how that finance uh, uh, may, be, may be addressed. But I think beyond finance, um, the, there are constraints also with regard to the relevant skills because to be an entrepreneur, you, you need not only the, the digital skills, the technical skills, the confidence to, to break into the market, but you also need the business skills of how to put together a, a, a business model, how to uh, sell it uh, to appropriate financiers and how to implement it and, and to keep on implementing it until uh, you can be successful. And, um, and I guess we often neglect the, uh, the soft side of, of the, uh, the, the, the issue. Um, uh, and it, it, for organizations such as ourselves, the World Bank Group, it's often much easier to invest in the, the harder side, the infrastructure, uh, the financing, than it is to invest in the softer side of the skills development and the business models. But um, I think when we get on to a later session talking about tech hubs, I'll talk about some of the things that the World Bank Group is doing in that area. Thank you. Thank you, team. Sam? I, I, I think, uh, for, sorry, I'm part of the Jumia team. Uh, for those that don't knew, know Jumia, we, uh, we build marketplaces uh, across Africa. Marketplaces that allow businesses, SMEs, uh, and larger businesses as well to meet customers and to sell to customers. Um, and through that to have impact and change people's lives. Um, I mean, I think there's a big topic uh, around this, which is, which is another form of, of, of blending, I think, as, as Catherine put it, of a way of, of supporting traditional lending which is another option to the grant model, which is actually through data. Because I think what we see on a regular basis is, is entrepreneurs running out of working capital um, and, and therefore literally stopping, you know, guys that have maybe been on Bongo Hive and, and found product market fit, they've done the hard bit. They've worked out how to develop a product that people want to buy, but then they've run out of working capital and so they stop selling. Um, and when they go to traditional lenders like banks and even microfinance institutions, they don't get funded, or angels. They don't get funded, and they don't get funded because the funders, the providers of finance, don't have the data to make the decisions about who they should invest in, and therefore to de-risk the whole enterprise. And I, so I think the key here is, 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 is you know, a blending of data and traditional lending. And so the question is, who has that data and who can inject that data into the lending decision making so that we can make the decision to lend less risky for the providers of capital. Thank you, Sam. This, is, this we are going to take up in a big way. That's the next session. We come back and looking at the, what, are the, what financing uh, tools are out there, the models are out there. So, Andrietta, you wanted to, I mean, sorry, Amolo, you wanted to say a few things? Uh, yeah, I wanted to make a comment about the question of what skills are needed by entrepreneurs uh, to, to attract especially international capital. And uh, Village Capital put out a report earlier this year that said that 92% of investment in fintech enterprises in uh, Africa last year went to companies that had an expat founder or leader. And in India, 70% of the, the, the funds went to people who had attended a set of 10 elite international institutions. 
Um, and I guess my question to the uh, organizations that fund entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship is, what are the skills that people really need in, to, in order to attract investment? Are those skills in presenting PowerPoint pitches, or are they skills in running a business? Um, and I think there's been or continues to be uh, a lot of emphasis on training people to do PowerPoint pitches and beautiful business plans, and, and yet the real skill and maybe some of the, the data that Sam is talking about the real skill has to be identifying your customer, serving your customer with something they want, getting paid for that, and making uh, an investment in your business to deliver on it. And I do wonder if we focus on the wrong type of skills, which are short-term uh, and really irrelevant to developing the business, when there are shortages of business skills. I think that's true. Um, and those are not things that uh, can be cured in a three-week boot camp, I think. Um, I, I can't remember. Somebody mentioned the development of the Indian Institutes of Technology. It's been a 30-year 30 30 investment program that has paid off big time, but not short term. Thank you, Amono. I think this is a very good point for us to now reach out to the audience. So our question is, what are the main barriers facing digital entrepreneurs in Africa? And give us some of your feedback, and then we will move to the next session of what financing models are out there to fulfill the needs. Toby. Thank you so much to all the panelists for great uh, early interventions here. I'd like to ask two questions, and I cannot really point to anyone. You pick it up as, as you want. One is that we all always hear about Kenya, Nairobi, and South Africa here. There are so many countries here in Africa. What do you see, what lessons can be learned from these three hubs, sort of, from Nairobi, Lagos, and maybe Cape Town, that can be sort of uh, helping the other uh, aspiring countries to, to do more in this area. And the other thing is, uh, it's interesting to hear this emphasis on skills to support the financing issue. Where do you see the best examples of trying to address this uh, skills barriers? Is it the same three countries that uh, have uh, come the furthest here in Africa? Um, or uh, do you see interesting uh, things happening in other countries as well? Thank you. Yes, please, on that side. Okay, I have uh, the lady at the back. Please uh, introduce yourself. Hi, good morning. My name is Nandini Harireshwara. I work for the UN Capital Development Fund with Francois. Uh, and one of the questions that's been posed, especially by Molo, and I really appreciated her question, was what, what skills or, or what do entrepreneurs really want help with, other than financing. We know financing is a big issue. And when we talk about that in our markets, especially in Zambia and Malawi, what actually comes up quite often are two, three big things. One is um, they would like mentors, uh, both in their particular regions and uh, globally, that can help them better understand how to leverage their services and products in their markets. Two is connections to the big players. How can they really connect to the big players, again, both in their markets and outside of their markets, uh, to, to leverage platforms, infrastructure, mobile money infrastructure, or other kinds of infrastructure? And three is policy and regulation. Um, sometimes they're putting forward services and, and, uh, and goods that are very unique to the market that need to be tested. And so how do they, what is the roadmap that they can build with regulators in their countries to better understand how to test those in a safe way where regulators will be comfortable but actually can provide innovation in their markets. Thank you. I think you want, yes, please go ahead and please introduce yourself and I'll come to the middle and to this side and we'll circulate a bit. Uh, good morning. My name is Martin Bayer from Strathmore University. Uh, latching on to what Amolo had uh, discussed and also building on uh, some of the statements made by the President and the Secretary General of UNCTAD, uh, Mukisa 
Kitu pointed out more needs to be invested into the ecosystem. He mentioned multiple one percent in terms of how much maybe goes into research, etc. Uh, the president earlier this year, Uhuru Kenyatta, visited Strathmore and heard from micro small enterprises. They have a skill gap. They desire to export to global markets, continental markets. Uh, could the panel and pack uh, a little bit more. How do we bridge this inequality? Uh, partially what Amolo alluded to, uh, let me call them domestic entrepreneurs, and then secondly, micro small enterprises. How do we give them access to a lot of these opportunities we are hearing? And what can an institution like Strathmore do to position itself to fill that gap? Much. Yes, please, go ahead. Good morning. I will speak in French because I'm not good at English. Okay. Alors, je suis. I'm Anthony Ouassiri. I'm from Burkina Faso, and I'm promoter of the Google Faso e-commerce platform. This is a platform which uh, focuses on local products in Burkina Faso. We mainly focus on showcasing products from local markets from Burkina Faso and also artisanal products from the country. In terms of financing, we should say that even often ourselves as young entrepreneurs, we don't really know about the existence of some sources of financing. Earlier I was surprised to hear about a certain number of uh, points raised by the panelists that I wasn't aware of. And it leads me to ask the question, for us young people who have already launched platforms that are in existence but which need a certain amount of expansion now, what should we do? At present we need really to strengthen what we've already done. We've added, for example, uh, an Android application through which people can place uh, orders for our platform. So this was launched at the beginning of the year. And it creates an argument from the beginning, but then you have to be able to really push this further and uh, pursue this in terms of gaining loyalty of customers and taking other aspects into account, such as communication, the implementation of a network for distribution, etc. And all of this requires financing too. So my question is to know whether at present there is a possibility for a company like uh, our company to really approach people here who could support us in this kind of area. So to expand companies like mine to make my company a true driver for development. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, excuse me, please. I will speak uh, in French. Okay, bonjour tout le monde. Je suis, uh... Good morning, everybody. I'm Zodé Stavi. I'm president of the Cameroonian E-Commerce Federation, also president of the Foundation for the Promotion of E-Commerce in Africa. I'm also an entrepreneur for Motazori Cam, a company specializing in logistics and e-commerce. We're currently working on an application for mobile payments. In Cameroon, there is a gap in this area. There are only two operators working in this field, Kenya and uh, Orange Money. So we are developing an application which will enable us to carry out online payments. As many African young entrepreneurs, we are faced with the issue of financing though. So I'd like to understand uh, how the various panelists uh, here today could help us and support us in order to implement this solution in Cameroon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me take two more and then, yeah. One who is waving vigorously, yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Abia David, and I'm from Burundi. And uh, my question goes to the panel on different issues. Uh, most of them I've talked to, uh, like Nicholas, uh, has talked about what they're doing with the Africa Development Bank. And uh, he said that uh, they're supporting through creating innovation hubs and all those kind of things. And he also said that they recently created an ICT uh, an ICT center of excellence in Rwanda. And my question goes because uh, in Burundi we are doing a lot of young people 
I, I, I am the president and founder of, a, of an organization called the Save African Youth Campaign. And what we're doing, we are, tra we are training a lot of youths, almost 11,000 already, on digital, uh, digital entrepreneurship. But the, most challenge, the, the main challenge that you have is on innovation hubs. We don't have, uh, well, and someone else, I think it's Catherine, or, or Catherine Collins, who's also talked about their support in infrastructure. I think, uh, uh, I just want to ask, what is there, what is there, is there any program specialized for Burundi or that is aiming Burundi? Because we really need the infrastructures and we really need an innovation hub. And we really want to know if there's uh, any program either of the Africa Development Bank or of the, uh, of the East African Europe Investment Bank. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me take one more question from the lady here. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Chanai Mukumba. Um, I work for an NGO called Cuts based in Zambia. Um, I just had a quick question. One of the speakers mentioned that um, when looking at investing in sort of startups, um, at times there can be a bias, I think, towards either um, expat-led um, sort of companies or um, a bias towards, for example, um, investors that potentially went to elite schools. I'm curious to know to what extent is this an issue in terms of attracting investment to African startups um, and how can this be dealt with? Thank you very much. So with that, please hold on to your questions because we will have many uh, other opportunities for you to ask these uh, queries. So I think what we have is we, now the entrepreneurs have spoken, so let me uh, get some of you, if you want to, the, our panelists, if you want to jump in and address some of these issues, but they will also be addressed in the, in the, in the later when we really get to the, the nitty gritty of the financing models that we have in this region. Andrea, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, I can start with the, the, the question that was asked here at the front around um, the fact that most um, investments are being made in Nigeria. If you think about sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, and why that's the case and what can be done to make that um, uh, to, to make the other economies uh, generate, I guess, uh, good uh, tech entrepreneurs that can be supported and funded. Um, I think... I mean, interestingly, the way we did it, uh, if, if we, when we looked at where to focus, so we focus, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa because fundamentally it's an early ecosystem, so one country really focus on a country. And also, if you think about the markets on the African continent, uh, all our com well, um, all the companies that we've invested in are actually operating in another market or even two other markets because we have small, um, we're very fragmented as a continent in terms of uh, the countries. So, so what you find is, uh, especially in, in East Africa, you need to immediately have a regional focus uh, when you're, when you're uh, starting your company. So I think while not every country is going to thrive in terms of uh, getting a lot of uh, digital or tech entrepreneurs, they will benefit because many of the country companies are moving outside of their home base and going into the other markets. And if I just think, and the way what we did, one of the things that we did is when we looked at our deal flow, um, you know, as companies are coming in and then did a, an analysis of where are they based, uh, then we also look at sectors and the likes. And we found that uh, about 80% of the companies are coming from Nigeria and Kenya, uh, fundamentally, and then South Africa is about 10 to 15% um, of the of the deal flow. So the prime, those are the the primary markets, and then over, um, the secondary markets in terms of where we see the most deal flow is uh, so it's Ghana, Ivory Coast, Senegal, Cameroon also features. Um, and I think if I was to, to think through what, is, what are some of the reasons this is the case, I think what I would say, which I think is stuff that has already been mentioned on this panel, uh, one is around government support uh, for these ecosystems. Uh, you find uh, while Rwanda is a small market, uh, there's a lot of government support. So you find, for example, com companies like Andela have now set up an office uh, in, in Rwanda. If you think about Nigeria, Omobola Johnson, who was the, firma, the first uh, ICT minister, did a lot to build the tech ecosystem. Uh, she's actually also now a partner in our fund, but she seeded a venture capital fund. She, she seeded 
uh, accelerators and innovators and was really support and supporting the, the ecosystem. So the, and also, of course, uh, here in Kenya as well, uh, you find a lot of support in, in South Africa. So I think government support is key, and on top of that is infrastructure. Because you can't be a tech entrepreneur without connectivity, um, without you know, energy. You know, there are just some key things that no matter how, how much you try, you just need the infrastructure. So infrastructure is also very key. Uh, I think and then another one, of course, that has been said here several times is around skills. Uh, so you find, because companies also need to go to a place where you're able to get both technical skills as well as business skills, and you find that those markets are markets that are generating um, a lot of the technical skills. I mean, let me I just refer back to Andela. One of the markets that, so they're in Nigeria, Kenya, they've also launched in Uganda because they see a high um, concentration of technical skills. So, so part of it is the foundation is the primary and secondary school education uh, the, and the quality of that. Um, and the, so, so set, setting the foundation for 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 the for entrepreneurs to have the skills to actually uh, support uh, tech uh, tech companies, um, and then I think the other one is really market size, um, because, and I think also this is just a comment I'll make in general. I think one of the challenges that I find as an investor is that there's a disconnect um, in the whole ecosystem. So you find, and I think we need to do a better job. We we find that there's a disconnect between the accelerators, incubators, and the investors because sometimes they talk about investment maybe a couple of weeks into the program. But I think that's, that's quite key because if you're building a business that needs to raise capital, then you need to know what, what, what investors are looking for and what... Um, because some, some businesses, so we look at, you know, it's the market, it's the company, and then it's like the actual investment. So if you're building a, a company uh, in a market that's not very sizable, it'll be very difficult to raise capital. So something can just be just on the market that you're addressing uh, can be quite small. Thank you so much. I think, Francois, you wanted to go, but very briefly. And I know Sam wants to say something too, and followed by Simon Sa. So And then we close, and then we go to the the nitty-gritty of what exactly is the, the financing models out there. Perhaps I can reply in French, since there are French speakers in the room. I think it's what they need from Burkina Faso to ask the question. Thank you for the LinkedIn request as well. I'll accept it uh, as soon as possible. I'm happy to hear your question, in fact, because we've just launched our program in Burkina Faso. It was launched just two weeks ago. And... Uh, We'll have a three-year program in the country to stimulate innovation. The main goal for our main date is to ensure that innovation don't only affect people at the top of the pyramid. We really want innovation to trickle down to meet the needs of the people who are the most, uh, who are the poorest. For the time being, we're really looking at how we can implement this in Burkina Faso. We're trying to work with innovation labs and hubs there to strengthen their capacity and to become an intermediary in Burkina Faso for all startup companies so that they can have access to financing and access to the skills that they need. So I would propose that uh, I put you in contact with my colleagues in Burkina Faso, and that will be a first way to move forwards. Now, for our colleague from Cameroon, I can't see him. Oh, there he is. Just to answer in French as well. We're not in Cameroon yet, unfortunately, but I'll give you a few pieces of advice. You're talking about mobile payments. I think Orange is on the market and MTN as well. I think it would be important in your case to have a good positioning with regards to these two companies, whether you want to compete with them or whether you want to leverage their skills. These could be enablers, in fact, I would call them. So as startups, you can leverage their knowledge and skills in order to, to move in forward in the market. In terms of financing issues, from the start, I think you're lucky to be in an area which covers quite a, a few areas, SEMAC which has common regulations and common markets. So you maybe should think on a regional level rather than national level. 
if I was an investor taking a position on startups, this would be very important to me because I could look at the possibilities for development in the area. I have a colleague from Cameroon. Perhaps I could also put you in contact with that person so they can give you more information on the situation in Cameroon. Francois, let me move to Sam, and then we need to... I think we are a bit running out of time now, according to my... Sure, sure, sure. Yes. Um, I think just, just a quick build, really, on what uh, Andriata was saying, uh, around the point around why, why is there such a focus of investment in the... And the three hubs mentioned in Nairobi, Lagos, and, and, and South Africa, Cape Town. Um, I think a big piece of this um, comes down to the fact that entrepreneurship in itself is about selling dreams right, to everyone involved in the ecosystem. Um, you know, one to, to a team, you know, because you have, you know, as an early entrepreneur, you need to bring people along on the journey with you and you need to get talented people that have other opportunities to go and work for more established companies or in other markets, for example, to come and join you. You need to convince entrepreneurs that it's, you know, it's worth taking the risk um, with you as well. Um, and so, and so what's, what's, what's important there is having early wins in the ecosystem, like companies from your ecosystem that have made it. Um, and I think if you look at those three hubs, uh, it's a chicken and egg thing, potentially. You know, if there was no investment, then maybe they wouldn't have made it. But if you look at Flutterwave in Nigeria, if you look at, you know, the tech success that is Mpeza here, even though it was sort of an intrapreneurship within Safaricom, um, or if you look at a number of other, you know, reasonably large successful companies here, if you look at Take A Lot, if you look at the, you know, the businesses uh, that have worked well in, in, in South Africa under the NASPAS brand, like I think of those hubs, they've all had ex examples of, tech businesses that have succeeded to quite a large scale early enough and that builds confidence within the investor sphere and within the 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 talent sphere as well that taking the risk involved with with early entrepreneurship is worthwhile simon so you have one minute all right great so uh market size is something that concerns us as well uh with regards to um when we have companies with a great idea that start to work, start, start to bid out, then the question then becomes uh, where are they going to grow out to? And you're completely correct when you talk about fragmentation within the, within the continent. So if we say Zambia, for example, is 13 million people, uh, 16 million people, somewhere there about uh, Malawi, 19, then uh, Zimbabwe, about 13. So what we've done is we've, we've decided to like, get together uh, with uh, two other hubs in Malawi and Zimbabwe from what we call the Southern African Venture Partnership, where we say, okay, great, can, can, we, get, can we get companies to get uh, a purview into what's happening in the other countries and to see those as opportunities for growth? So like, if it works in Zambia, can it potentially like, grow out into Malawi? Can it potentially grow out, um, grow out into Zimbabwe? So that, yes, you, 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 start, to get, you start to deal with the scale that uh, starts to interest investors uh, within that region. And so we're starting off with, for example, companies that have come out of Bongohai, for example, in the last three years, we have managed to raise at, at very, very early stage, uh, with early, early stage commitments, have managed to raise about $950,000 over the last three years. So we're saying, oh, great, how do we grow these and how do we help them get into, how do we help them scale out into other markets? And because, like I said, the, the interest is in, is in the three hubs as well, that's why we've now started considering, okay, great, Let's set up a fund so that we can help these companies grow into those regions. And then from there, when they get to a certain size, we can then attract uh, later stage finance to get into these companies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. So it's very coming clearly, very clearly, big populations, big middle classes, enabling environment. You know, you have business growing. This is kind of a back to basics kind of story. And that's why it's extremely important to have cross-border ability to do cross-border trading, more you do cross-border, you have a much bigger markets, much bigger middle classes to access. So now let me move to the, the next, the third issue for the discussion is we heard a lot about the commercial banks, our risk averse, and there are concerns to raise funds. Uh, so now I would like to, from your experience, I would like to raise what role the financial sector, including banks, of course, and venture, venture capital firms can play to enhance access to finance. So let me start with Sam, because Sam, you started to talk about blended funding, blended financing. So could you please take us through these new innovative ways of funding uh, if the, we cannot get funds from the commercial banks? Sure. I think, so the idea, I think, that, that 
that we've seen work, and we've started to do this uh, with partners on our side, is, is to, to leverage superior data to de-risk the decision of lending or investing. Um, for finances, and there are better placed people in this panel to, 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 to build on this, but a large part of the decision to invest or not comes down to do you believe in the growth story and the monetization story of the businesses in front of you? Um, and, um, and, you know, I think w by using data, you can, you can access that. So, for example, on the uh, e-commerce or, or on the online marketplaces type of business model, you have a lot of sales data. You have a lot of sales data and you have a lot of data, behavioral data as well so that you can differentiate between the SMEs that you're working with and you know, work out who are the people that are you know, behaving, you know, have consistency in their behavior, have consistency in their sales, and using that data to make the, the lending decisions. We, we've started to do it, we've started to share our data with microfinance institutions and with banks so that they can make better lending decisions. And so that, number one, makes more, you know, yes, gives more yeses to the financing decisions, like allows banks and those microfinance institutions to lend more, um, but also at better prices because the data de-risks the investing decision and therefore the rates at which they lend um, become more competitive, which is obviously helpful for the sustainability of, of those businesses. Thank you so much, Sam. Would you, Suman, so would you like to pick up some of the ideas that... Uh, he brought because you are a director of entrepreneurship at Bongo Hive, an innovation and technology hub in All right. you know, Lusaka. So what role do you see for the financial sector? So uh, I'm going to include something uh, in response to like Chennai's question around what, why is it that um, funding goes to certain, uh, to a certain... A lot of that is pattern recognition. It's um, people, people with the financing are so far away that they they have no idea what's going on on the continent. And we, we, we also, I have to admit, do a terrible job of selling ourselves, marketing ourselves, uh, and saying what's actually going on and making that visible to, uh, making that visible to, to everybody. So it becomes easier for a, fund, for a financer at, at an end to say, okay, great. Um, if, I look at, if I look at businesses here in the US, um, if, uh, how, many, how many have come from people that have gone to Harvard, have gone to Stanford, or whatever the case may be, then if I find a similar, if I find a similar cohort of people within, within the continent, then those are the people I can possibly trust to, to invest in. Um, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but it's, it's, it's something like that. But then, how do we solve it for ourselves then? Uh, so one place, where, one place that we need to start to encourage people is, um, if they're high net worth individuals within the country, is can they start to look at startups or uh, digital, uh, digital companies as alternative investments other than, for, other than where they're currently investing. So angel investment uh, then provides an opportunity. And that's a good thing because, um, again, I'm stereotyping, but then is angel investors will traditionally invest in uh, portfolios where they have previous experience uh, or an understanding of a sector uh, due, to, due, to, due to prior experience. So if somebody had a, a, a great experience in agriculture, they're more like, and then they've, they've managed to make some money, they're more likely to look at agriculture as a space that they understand and where the market opportunity is and to guide and work with a company in, in a sector that they understand. So then hopefully they've got the network and hopefully they've got the, 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 the not only the network, but they've got the, uh, words elude me right now. But um, they've got the stature to be able to say, great, because I'm involved in this company, they, that can attract follow-on investment. Say, okay, great, we know you, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know your experience, I know what, we know what you're able to do, and then we can invest, we, we can follow on, we can follow investments because you're close to a company in, in that place. Then again, it's, it's, it's the people working closest with the companies that are, that, that are coming up. Can they, can, they, can, they manage, can they help to manage the companies and work alongside the companies to make sure that as they grow in the early stage that they can, 
any finances that go into them can be managed, can be governed, and can, 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 can go to a stage where they are secure companies for, for follow investment. And then um, early stage early stage finances in, comp in, in, in in some of the in some of the regions uh, that 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 uh, before you get to funds that starts to look at a regional or more Africa play. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a very good point, Andreta. You want to follow up on what Simon says? Yes, please go ahead. Sure. I just want to to build on that. I think uh, my my also sense is that it's an early ecosystem. Uh, so a lot of that I think is a reflection of the fact that people are raising from their own networks or the networks that they've built because. Uh, like within Africa, there are no institutions that are investing in, in, tech, for, uh, in, in tech entrepreneurs and neither high net worth individuals. Uh, I think also we need more locally based uh, VCs because then I'm not, I understand the market, I understand the business model, I live in the market, so I'm not enamored by the fact that you went to a particular university. I, I need to see the market. Uh, so if, people, if we have more people who actually understand the market, I think some of that uh, distortion might go away. And then we need successes because uh, many ecosystems, uh, uh, entrepreneurs who are able to exit and succeed are the ones who come back and give to the, to, the, to, the, to the ecosystem. And then also it attracts more people to look at the, 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 the ecosystem. So we also need more successes. Let me turn to Catherine. Catherine, could you take us through some of the instruments you, you have at the EIB to deploy? In this sense, I think Boost Africa has come up as a good example in the region in, in many of the uh, discussions here. Thank you. Thanks. I think maybe I probably went through them. As I think we have a mandate, and that mandate enables us to deploy all various instruments, senior debt, junior debt, equity, and then technical assistance. But maybe if, if you allow me, I, mean, I would think, based on the various comments uh, th that were made, I think from the perspective of EIB, and EIB being based in Luxembourg, and then a representation here locally, I find myself very often having to somehow fight the case, uh, simply because the perception and I think there is a lot of which has to do about perception, perception of risk versus actual risk. And, and that is a very important element. And, and probably uh, I like the point that was made that maybe entrepreneurs need to market themselves better. But as financier, we also need to market, first of all, as, as somebody was saying, you know, all what exists in terms of instruments is not well known, so probably we have a bit of, of uh, uh, work to be doing on, on how do we, uh, you know, we mention and how we communicate about what we can do and do it maybe also it in a, a language that is more uh, comprehensible by, because we also have our own jargon. I mean, working for a new institution. I mean, sometimes even myself, I'm a bit disturbed by all the jargons that we are using. And so that's something we need to bear in mind and speak the same language. Um, the perception, but I also agree with Andreata, have successes. Because, and, and also the point about data and how it can help somehow mitigate this perception. Because as a banker, as a lender, you take risk, or as an investor, you take risk and you, accept, you expect either to get your money back or to, ex to get a return on your investment. And I think this is something that we, we can all accept and we should probably all accept because that's, that's the nature of the business. So we need to, to base ourselves, our judgment on something tangible. So an idea is very nice, but unfortunately it requires a bit more than that. And so that's why it's nice to hear that everything that is being done to bring ideas to a stage where it can materialize, but this, we need to have ideas that were a success, that were run by Africans, and the, uh, the concept of scalability is extremely important as well, because as an investor, you will only achieve a return provided you are able to scale up or to see the best business scaling up. So I think, um, as I said, I'm not a, this is all things that I have gathered from, from being here and discussing with the people here and then making the relay to our colleagues. And large institutions like us, we need to, to be able to understand what's happening on the field and, and uh, have success that we can after that uh, market 
to enable our colleagues then to be a bit less risk averse and go for it. I mean, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Anybody else here on the table? Eugene, you, would you like to add something at this stage? No? Okay, thank you. So I What's coming through very clearly is, you know, e-commerce and digital trade. This is a new space. So, of course, the bankers, the financiers would want to assess the risk. So when you don't know the business, you know, you are a bit nervous. So that's why the more data, was the, the, the requests for more data and maybe pretty PowerPoints and uh, somebody with a big degree from a big schools, you know, they would all play into the, into the story because, you don't, because a lot of people don't know the business. So the whole idea of the perception of risk and how do we address the perception of risk, how do you minimize the risk, uh, perception of risk in this area is, is a big takeaway for us here. So let us now move to the very fancy topic because everybody talks about the tech hubs, the incubators, the accelerators. I think this is, in Geneva, this is what our member states want to hear. What are the success stories? What are the conditions to success? So we are now moving into that topic. So that's our fourth issue for discussion, and we need a lot of input from you too, from the audience. So in view of the common reference to the role of tech hubs, incubators, accelerators in Africa, what do we know about their impact and how to ensure that they are effective? This is like the million dollar question that is being raised uh, by all and uh, sundry from UNCTAD, from our policy analysis sections too. So let me go to Tim. Tim, uh, uh, tell us from the World Bank experience, you know, what, how the World Bank has looked into the role of tech hubs and what lessons you have learned, you know, working across, the, across many regions. Sure. So, so thank you. Um, uh, when Nick was speaking earlier, he, he described the vision that the African Development Bank has developed for the digital economy in terms of four different quadrants. Well, we at the World Bank like to think ourselves as a little bit better. So we've gone for five uh, different uh, pillars <laughs> in our vision. So we think of the, um, the digital economy in terms of digital infrastructure, obviously, as being the, the foundation, uh, digital platforms, and we've talked about many of them, such as e-commerce and uh, digital ID, uh, digital financial services, both the supply side that we've talked about a lot on this panel, but also, of course, the, the demand side of, of how to promote uh, financial inclusion. Uh, digital skills and literacy, clearly very important. And then, of course, digital innovation and entrepreneurship, which is the, the subject of this panel. And it, it's, it's in some ways the most difficult to define. We, we recognize digital entrepreneurship when we see it, but we can't always uh, define it very well. And it's also, I think, um, uh, one of the hardest to develop uh, programs or interventions uh, that seek to um, uh, promote uh, digital innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, there are many examples of programs which have not been terribly successful, um, but equally I think there are uh, now a growing number of programs where, where we are seeing breakthroughs in terms of job growth, in terms of creation of new companies that, that then break out of the uh, of the sort of initial cycle of, uh, uh, fa of family and friends and actually make it uh, in into large-scale uh, employers. So in terms of um, the World Bank Group involvement, and uh, when I talk about the World Bank Group, obviously not only the IBRD that I work for, but also the... Um, the, the IFC, the, uh, the, the private sector arm, um, I, I, you can think of it in terms of three phases. I think pre-2010, we were very much invested in the more traditional model of science parks and industrial parks and a sort of real estate model for development. And um, that kind of fits the, 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 the business model of the World Bank quite well because we often look for big ticket items uh, to invest in. It's easier to get it past our board if, if, if there's an extra few zeros um, on the investment. But I, th I think we, we, we realized that that model wasn't working very well. There were too many white elephant uh, business parks around, um, around Africa and around the rest of the world. And um, what I sometimes call the empty incubator syndrome of incubators that look great from the outside, but they don't have a single um, coffee stain. They don't have a single uh, messy uh, entry line um, at, at the start. So how to avoid that, en uh, that empty incubator syndrome? So 
starting in 2010, we began investing, uh, initially using grant funding in tech hubs. I think one of our first investments was here in Africa, in the M Lab, East Africa, which I'm happy to say is continuing to do well even after the, uh, the grant money uh, ran out. Um, so much more focused on organic, uh, bottom-up sort of investments and at a smaller scale uh, using uh, uh, trust funds and grant funding. And since 2016, we've begun to convert that into um, more of the regular work program of the, of the bank, um, funding tech hubs through investment lending, which is, of course, the, uh, the main source of, uh, of, of activity from an organization like the World Bank. So what do we look for uh, when we're, we're seeking to invest in tech hubs? Um, I think an ecosystem approach in which there are multiple different stakeholders, uh, not only governments but also academia, the private sector, NGOs, um, community-based organizations. And we, we do tend to also look for a consortium style approach, um, perhaps a PPP or, or certainly a consortium approach uh, which brings together different investors. So for the MLab in East Africa, for instance, we worked with the University of Nairobi, iHub, which had uh, just opened as a, a, as a tech hub. Uh, we also brought in a training firm from the private sector and the World Wide Web Foundation as an NGO. We, we look for organizations to invest in that, that uh, have a program of sub-grants. Um, uh, for instance, when we're ingress, investing in a tech hub, we often insist that maybe uh, a third to a half of the money that we invest in the, in the uh, grant manager is reinvested in smaller grants that actually go to entrepreneurs. Because of our business model, we often find it difficult to reach out directly to entrepreneurs. But if we can use subgrants as a way of doing that, uh, all, all the better. We seek to avoid market dis uh, distortion if there is already a, a good commercial uh, sector for tech hubs or, a, or already a good uh, uh, tech hub scene in, in a country. We won't necessarily invest uh, and distort the market. I think one of the important messages is don't fight geography. Uh, a lot of um, uh, countries um, try to use their uh, investment in science parks and tech hubs as a way of maybe decentralizing growth from capital cities. And that's a very creditable um, alternative. But the reality is tech hubs that are um, in the middle of nowhere do not work. Um, Kenya has discovered that with its Konza city. Mozambique has discovered it with its uh, attempts to develop a, a science park 60 kilometers from Maputo. So don't fight geography. Go to where the people are rather than trying to move the people, um, creative people, to where the, uh, the money is. And then finally, we, we always try to use competitive tendering, um, and that, that always works well. So a few examples of how we've invested. I mentioned our support for MLAB East Africa here in Nairobi. We also have a bigger investment at the uh, Climate Tech Center at Strathmore University and uh, at NILAB, uh, which is in the um, Bishop Magwa Center um, on Ngong Road, uh, which uh, Nick mentioned as being the sort of epicenter of entrepreneurship in Nairobi. In South Africa, we invested in the MLAB Southern Africa and in uh, Senegal, uh, we invested in CITIC also as a, a sort of startup uh, uh, tech hub. Uh, we have some new investments in Ghana, which are part of this new wave of using um, investment lending. And we've invested in um, uh, Ghana Innovation Hub and Ghana Tech Lab, both in, um, in Accra, at the Accra Digital Center. And we've also invested in uh, an innovation hub in Kumasi. I think this is one of the first times that the bank has invested in a tech hub outside of a capital city. Um, in Malawi, um, uh, I think uh, our colleague um, Simonza was talking about uh, uh, Bongo Hive's in investments in, in Malawi. Well, we, we also have um, a $5 million program, uh, which we'll be rolling out there as part of the new um, uh, Digital Malawi program. And, um, and finally, in Comoros, we've invested in a, a co-working space. It's clear that not every economy has the, uh, uh, the scale or the, um, uh, the startup developer community to be able to support a, a fully blown incubator or a, a tech hub. And therefore, I think working with um, co-working spaces, as we are doing in Comoros, is a, is a good way of sort of um, getting your, your feet wet in a, a particular market and, 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 and helping, if you like, the pre-incubation space, uh, the, the the creation of new ideas, the creation of, of new entrepreneurs. So that's a brief uh, picture of what we're trying to do. And as I say, we try to picture ourselves as just a little bit better than the African Development Bank. So wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
cute team, so let me get to Nick, because I heard Nick saying it is so wrong. So tell us how African Development Bank is doing a much better job than the World Bank. Yes, well, this, this could be a long conversation. <laughs> You're short. <laughs> no, don't worry. Uh, everything um, uh, Tim said, God bless him. Um, aside from his, 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 his criticism of the, the bank, the bank um, was right. I mean, it, it's, it's fair uh, what they're doing on hub development. Uh, we have taken a, a more uh, um, an approach more aimed at trying to get governments to, to resolve their thinking around the, the tech, tech space in the first place. Um, so whilst um, Tim's working down in the, the area of, you know, the young entrepreneurs getting his hands dirty and pa passing cash through, we're trying to create the, the ecosystem that allows the, the entrepreneur to, to uh, bring forward ideas. And, you know, we, we, we have ideas our, ourselves um, around how you can get access to devices in markets um, through g uh, government intervention, um, but that, to, that would actually allow... Um, students to, to access um, devices that they could then use to create, while still at university, um, entrepreneurial ideas. We, we aren't so dismissive of technology parks per se, but we think that the, the governments need to t use, if they're going to think about a technology park, they've got to think about what's their pri actual priority here. What, what is it that they're focusing on? And it's not enough just to build a technology park and think people will come. They won't. Um, you have to market it. So you, if you go through the marketing exercise, you'll understand what actually might work in a given area. And we, we financed a, a park in, in Senegal, and it's kind of generic, I confess. And that's p possible in Senegal because it's, it's, got a, 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 it's becoming a tech hub of its own in West Africa. Companies will want to set up there because they need a presence in West Africa. But if you go to some of the other countries like Mali and Burkina afterwards, they're not going to be able to attract those same companies as their hub headquarters. So what is it that they're attracting? And I think it is valuable for, for, com for governments to think about what their priorities are but obviously listen to the private sector on the ground. So we're trying to help, help governments at, the, at that strategic level think about their prior, priorities um, with a view to removing some of the impediments that governments uh, put in place to, to entrepreneurism and seeing how they might actually foster it through things like skills, skills development. We're less busy at the moment in the, the actual um, innovation space at the hub level. That's something we're reviewing at the, at the moment. We don't have the, the breadth of um, instruments that, that Tim has access to on the grant financing um, side, um, but that is certainly something that the bank's trying to address within its skills portfolio. Um, so we, you'll see more on that, and we'll be dragging on lessons from others like the World Bank about you know what's actually an effective model. I think that's st still open for debate, and I uh, you know half expecting a lot of questions back and comments back from from, from the audience today about what what actually works. Um, last point I would would say is I think we can be worried about events in Africa and how things are developing. I do think they're timing issues, and I don't think we should get lost on a point and be too negative. This is a continent that's get quickly getting digitized. It's moved a heck of a long way from 20 years ago, and it's moving ever faster. A lot of this thing around where, where finance finally goes and, you know, its predilection to, you know, capital follows capital, that will get break and broken down as we see other, other successes. And I, I think that was the, the point others have said on the panel. So, you know, I think things are, things are running well. I think we've got good problems, for example, at the bank in trying to work out which hubs are good rather than worrying about there's no hubs at all. So... Thank you very much. On this point, let me talk to, uh, turn to Simon. So you have the only one on this panel actually running a tech hub. So what do you think are the key factors to make a tech hub works to support the digital entrepreneurship? You know, what are the key conditions for success? You have made it a success. All right. So I have to confess that I'm a skeptic with regards to whether hubs can work everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I actually don't think they can. And... Uh, I think we've, we've belabored the point that, for example, there are certain elements to build good companies. And some of those are, for a hub to succeed, it needs, it's the people. 
You, you need the right people to be able to come into the hub to start these companies and then build these companies that are going to become the successes. And if the people have the skills that they require to build these companies, that's the first thing that you're going to need. So where, where are these people going to come from? And uh, the closer you are to them, the better. So for example, uh, being in a place where a university is close or a place that, provide, that, that, that is churning out people with digital skills or with their business skills or with, uh, well, makes, makes, starts, starts to help you get to a place where, you can, where, you, where you've got people that can, young people that can come in or regardless of, of age, you've got people that can come in with ideas and then can, that can get started and can, they can find other people that they can bring onto their teams to build these companies there. there. Then it's uh, access to people who've had experience building businesses, people who are going to be mentors, people who can, people who can work alongside, uh, people who can work alongside um, these people who are building businesses, people who can uh, give insights into markets, people who can give insights into, in, uh, into, into the technical uh, knowledge that uh, the, uh, these new businesses are going to, uh, are going to need to have a access to. And then it's uh, connections and partnerships. So where are the companies that they're going to be connected to? Uh, so if, they, if, they, if, 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 if a company is going to need to work with a mobile network operator, for example, uh, as part of their scale and part of their rollout, it doesn't help that you're 300 kilometers away from the, closest, from the head office of, 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 of a mobile network uh, operator. Uh, if you're, if you're working in agriculture, are you close enough to be able to talk to, the, are you close to market, are you close to, are you close to, 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 the, to, the, to, the, to the, to the, to the companies that are getting out into, into places where the agriculture, uh, agriculture is, is taking place. So th those are, those are some of the elements that I think that, uh, that, 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 that provide for um, uh, what is a potentially a great place to, 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 uh, to set up a hub with. Uh, I just need to correct um, um, something that Tim said, um, which is something we'd like to get to, but haven't started yet, is that yes, we'd like to get to a place, we are, set, we are in the process of setting up, setting up a fund that would do seed stage investments that would, get to, that would look at Lusak, uh, Zambia, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. Uh, we haven't yet started investing in Malawi. Yeah, so yeah, that, that, I needed to correct that. Okay, so I think uh, maybe we can start the discussion to invest in Malawi. So let yeah. me now move to Sam. Sam, what do you have? What experience do you have from Jumia? I think a point that was made on the floor before um, that can be a key enabler of success is, is mentoring. Uh, and again, I think that's one of the benefits of hubs um, is you know, being able to, you know, companies that are just getting started, that have had their first signs of success, being able to learn the basics of business building from people that are just in front of them. Uh, and, and, and I think a lot of the conversations that, that, that I have with, with companies that are starting out, um, often that are in these hubs as well, is, you know, how do you hire? How do you, you know, how do you structure your team? How do you think about, um, you know, the real fundamentals of business building stuff that you probably don't get at the sort of really practical level from your investors or for, from people around you that aren't business, building businesses. So I think that sort of mentorship thing is, is, is very interesting. I think one, you know, one idea that we've, we've been playing with actually for, for the Kenya office here is, is, is we're going to move into a new office relatively soon and you know, could we do that in the same facility as a, as a hub, for example, so that we could, you know, there could be cross-pollination of ideas and, and, and lots of new businesses that build up around our business. Um, so I think that's an interesting model. Thank you so much. So what's coming out is the, the ecosystems approach yeah. to incubators. That's a kind of a, one of the key success uh, factors. So let me, uh, before I go to Francois, uh, Andrieta, you wanted to add to some of the comments that's been made here. Yes, uh, just from, uh, from an investor's point of view in terms of um, what are uh, effective accelerators or incubators because these are critical to us because these should be feeders of some of our deal flow. And uh, so I think two things um, that I would see as valuable is one, building an ecosystem, so creating a, val a vibrant ecosystem where people can meet co-founders, they can get the mentoring and the support um, that they need or just learn about what's happening in the, in the ecosystem. And then the second one, which is where we feel we've not done very well in terms of the tech hubs on the continent, is to be factories of companies that are investable. 
uh, because I think fundamentally that should be the, the KPI, that should be the ultimate goal, uh, so that it's not just uh, a place where uh, people, young people are coming together, but it should be more than that. We should actually be building companies from these, uh, from these tech hubs. So I think um, what has happened is, if I, I, I'm hard pressed to come up with, say, five companies that have you know, raised significant follow-on funding that came out of the hub. So I think also as, as we build and as we support tech hubs, I think it's important to think through what are the key elements that will make these hubs become factories of, of tech companies for the continent. Very good points, Andreta. Francois, because the UNCDF is supporting tech hubs, incubators, and accelerators, so tell us, share your experience, experience with us and what lessons you have learned in this experience. Yes, thank you. So, I think from more perspective, uh, I think this tech hub, they are amazing or fabulous platform in order to scale innovation in the countries where we are. But we recognize that in all of the country where we are, the level of development is, is, uh, is very different. And I think from a, I speak from a development organization point of view, I think what we just need all of us to make sure is that we invest long term in this platform. And I, I think I would like to warn all of us, I'm, I don't like Akaton anymore. And why I don't like Akaton? Because I think in the development organization, we all want to position ourselves for innovation. And the fast way to do that is just to invest maybe 30 or 40,000 in a tech lab and you will get, let's say, a five three-day challenge, and so you can really promote it, good result. But I don't think it's good for innovation, and I tell you why. I've been speaking with a lot of tech hub. I think what we are creating, we are not creating entrepreneurs, we are creating good presenters of ideas that are jumping from one idea to another ideas just to get the prize money. And so when you, learn, when you talk with a lot of these uh, hubs in different countries, I think in the country, we are in Uganda, we are in Zambia, we are in different countries, I think that's what we learn. And they say, so I think what, from a development organization point of view, let's make sure that we, we go beyond the ID stage and we invest long term into this. And so that's the role that UNCDF is currently, let's say, doing in different countries. So what we would like to do, our objective is really to grow the market and to develop, let's say, the innovation at country level. So according to the level of the development of the hubs, we, I think we provide different tools that can really, let's say, grow the capacity, the skills, the financial uh, of the hubs. And I think that complements quite really well what is done by African Development Bank, so IBRD, because we don't have a lot of fundings. Mainly we have a lot of skills. We have some small funding in order to anticipate. So what do we do? So tech hubs, I think, as I say, as different levels. So it can be sometimes only a co-working space. I think it's the first start. So what we are providing and tools, for example, uh, mentorships. So we discuss about mentorship. So we have a, a network of mentor, international mentors on different areas that we can really complement, let's say, and we, are, we provide that as a tool for this event tech up with the objective not to replace the mentor, but really to transfer the capacity to the tech up just to make sure that step by step they can do that on their own. The second part, we, we discuss about blended finance. I think the UNCDF, we have the, I think the, the opportunity, we have different financial instruments going from small grants, loan, guarantee, and also some investment. So we are really willing to work with different entrepreneurs and complement the work of the tech ups in order to be able to provide the right uh, services. Also in countries, so we have teams that have deep relationship with the government, with the private sectors. So the objective is also to be able to link this tech hub to some of the government. And I think it's not always easy for a startup company to be able to knock at the door of MTN, Orange, or all this, this different planner. It's not easy for a startup company to try to understand the government and policy and regulatory uh, environment. So that's also an area where we can contribute. Um, and the, I think one of the also last part that we are bringing, we are in several countries, so we can also make the link and contribute regionally and globally to the different, uh, to the different hubs just to make sure that I think all these ideas can be leveraged and offer better pr perspective and grow perspectives for the different startup. Thank you, Francois. Anybody else wants to add something to this discussion? Eugene, would you want to say something? 
Yes, I just wanted to say that um, it's also, I think, interesting um, um, to, to observe that even as, I mean, the, the hubs are, are great ideas and, and, and there's a lot to, uh, to learn. They produce most of, of, of our investors um, or techpreneurs, but I would I think it's great if the um, if governments and development partners would focus more on uh, skills other than the talent that they bring um, within those spaces. Uh, but also to reflect on the nature of this, uh, this area, which is digital world, um, to not just think about the real estate, but also the e-spaces that you can create as network spaces for some of these um, techpreneurs, because some of the um, uh, uh, engineers, software engineers, for example, they are, they are really not very social, and they run away from these kind of spaces. So if you create for them a virtual space uh, where you give them the information and the training that they wish for, you will find you might attract more people than, than you would find in a physical space. Um, thank you. We should have space for nerds. Yeah, Simon, sir. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment with regards to uh, tech hubs also find them space, currently find themselves in a space where they're, they're conflicted between um, uh, responding to or building companies that interest investors, so potentially high growth companies, uh, which then, and producing numbers for uh, people who will support them through grants. So, so you find that for a grant that you get, you say, okay, great, you should have 500, I exaggerate, but I mean, like, you should have 500 entrepreneurs by the end of the year. And you're not going to get 500 high growth companies at the end of that year. Uh, so, it, it, so anybody who's thinking of getting into the Tech Hub Accelerator incubator space should really think about whether this is the right tool, uh, whether this is the right tool for you to use to build in. If you're building small businesses, that's, I think that's a different tool. That's, a, that's, a, that's something that you should intentionally decide to do and say, okay, great. We want to release small business support, give business advice, help businesses become, uh, help small businesses access financing from banks and so forth and so on, all that stuff. But if you're building businesses that are going to attract investment finance, that's, it's a different, it's a, it's a totally different type of vehicle or a different, different type of uh, um, entity that you're building uh, that's, that's going to be able to do that. And uh, conversations need to be very, very clear with, uh, with grant supporters ahead of time to say, okay, great. We're not going to do scale. We're not going to do 1,000 people. We're not going to do 10,000 uh, 10, people uh, yeah, in that way. Yeah. Allow me to just add one point, please. Um, yeah. Yes, please go Thanks. Ahead. Yeah, Francois raised a point, which uh, I think it's one that uh, we have uh, uh, experience with, which I would like to also just elaborate on. Um, it is true that sometimes you just have very good presentations being made to potential uh, investors and donors. Um, but it is equally true that um, because of that lack of connection between and the distance between investors, um, development partners, and this world of techpreneurs, uh, sometimes great ideas don't get either well pitched or funded uh, because of that space. And Perhaps the development partners and investors could also have a different approach where instead of just sitting and waiting for great PowerPoints, which then could lead to misinvestment, uh, they could float areas that they wish to finance and say that if you have a great idea that will, for example, ensure greater efficiency in this area, health, agriculture or something, we will fund it um, subject to certain objective criteria so that by the time you're meeting with these techpreneurs, you, they already know that, you know what you want to fund and that your interests are aligned. And in that case, then I would suggest that they focus more on program or project financing. Thank you, Eugene. Good point. So I'm coming back to all of you to, uh, uh, to you to get to that point. So let me uh, collect some questions. Yeah, I, I know you uh, wanted to say something earlier too. Please go ahead and identify yourself, please. Uh, my name is Imatendo. I'm a CEO of a Burundi Shop Company. Uh, me as a, one of the pioneers of e-commerce startup in Africa, uh, in East Africa, I can tell you that we experienced a big challenge to in raising fund for e-commerce project. Uh, I met many, many uh, local investors 
and are, they are uh, enthusiastic of, with our project. But when we ask them to invest in, they are not ready to invest. Even those who accept to invest, the engagement is very, very limited. Even uh, commercial bank are not ready to finance e-commerce project because they loan are currently uh, oriented toward short-term uh, short projects with a quick return of investment. Uh, I can tell you that in my in board, I have a pattern, a bank, uh, a commercial bank as a pattern, but it's still very, very hard to raise the fund from them. So my question is, uh, we tried also with uh, some pri private sector organization uh, as Trademark East Africa. And I can tell you that my project is very, very innovative and I won a competition called uh, Trademark East Africa. I was in the first, uh, in the, as a, in a finalist, but I didn't get the award they, they has uh, promised to me to, to in that uh, uh, competition. So uh, I have two questions. My question is the, what e trade for all can do to create a fund for supporting or to reward an innovative e commerce project. Uh, another question goes to uh, Nicholas and uh, Francois, as a private sector company, is it possible to get access to finance from African Development Bank or European uh, Bank? If yes, which is uh, the condition? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think there's a little bit of a pitching going on here too. So uh, please also share your views on your own experience in tech hubs, incubators, accelerators too, because we want to hear from the real people who have gone through these, uh, uh, these models. Yes, please, the lady here. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Juliana Kisimbi. I'm a Kenyan. And I was a former director in the team that implemented Kenya's single window and <coughs> electronic platform for trade. Uh, so mine is really like a console to, to find out. Uh, I'll ask a question and then I'll give her a comment. My question is, would it be easier if the techno hub uh, innovators come together and they pitch together as a team? Is it easier to get financing together or as individuals? And my comment then would be that if they are able because somebody will find something that they can see is ongoing. I'll go off, uh, like our own example, we, we transformed paper into a parastatal that employs over 100 employees today. And what we saw was that one, it under, I think it's chapter 20 of the United Nations uh, uh, requirement is that African countries that have the single window are able to trade easily with the globe. So that was a requirement. So we had to meet that requirement. And how did that requirement have to be met? It had to be met through a structure. And what was the structure? The structure was a board and a management team and staff. We, we had to have a body that would be able to attract uh, that, uh, let's say, uh, funding. And so once we were up and running, we were able to get funding from the International Climate Fund, from the World Trade Organization, from Trademark East Africa, and from many other organizations. So what am I saying? In a very simple nutshell, nobody, most people with money will not fund an idea most of the time, but they will fund an ongoing project that looks credible and that it's got a future and that it's got a good ROI. So basically, the projects must be ongoing. A very simple example, I have a friend living in the United States. She did an invention and she was selling from the backyard of her bedroom and online. 
And when she went to pitch her idea when her customer base grew, she got funded 50,000 US dollars because she already had a client base. She, she had a product which needed an upgrade of a better packaging and more ingredients. So basically what you need to do, you must have something going for you to be able to attract money. Money only gets attracted by other money. So that's how it goes in this business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Yes, please go ahead. Merci, je veux parler en français. Speak in French. I'm Ms. Jackie Mzoumini from the DRC. I'd just like to try and set out a few issues with regards to concerns in my country. The question of financial inclusion is a concern in the DRC. At present, we have a few solutions through uh, mobile operators operating in the country. So Vodacom, Vodafone, Artel, and Orange. These are trying to instill a solution in terms of transactions in the country, given the poverty and the lack of infrastructure in our country. We have these three operators who are working in the field for mobile money, but unfortunately they're not interconnected, so that's a challenge. Here I'd like the panelists to try and explain to us what they think we could uh, put in place so that all operators can come to the table and be interconnected to facilitate transactions. That's the first concern. Secondly, within our country, there are operators in the back country who have products but they can't uh, sell these due to the issues that I've already raised. What solutions could we implement from the panelists in order to resolve these back country issues in the country? Now, with regards to what Ms. Let me find this in my notes. With regards to what Ms. Catherine said, she said that uh, she's been operating in Kenya for around three years, and uh, there are solutions for activities or transactions related to mobile telephony, which would enable mobile money. But then when she goes back to her country, she feels like she's entering into another world. So we are working on e-commerce in Africa here. What can other Africans in other countries facing these issues can do? And how have some countries found solutions in terms of interconnectedness? For the continental free trade area in Africa, what has been implemented so that we can resolve these issues of connection, which uh, are also issues for e-commerce as a whole? Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Much as a moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I will, uh, I will uh, take my intervention in French because I'm, I'm from Benin. My name is uh, José Simbo. I'm Joseph Simbo. The government. Okay. Uh, I'll suivre un peu les. So I've been listening closely to the statements, and we see that the experiences are varied and really diversified. When we look at tech hubs, we can see that uh, there is capacity building for young entrepreneurs. There's a possibility of having mentoring. In commercial banks, for support to new uh, startups, there is some reticence there because often the business model is not reassuring enough and people are not willing to take this risk. Regional development banks are based on uh, governmental strategies, though, as I heard from Mr. Nicola. For the UNCDF and the World Bank, they are also looking directly at these issues. But globally, you can see that one of the models of action uh, is to have pitches to look at innovations and new models. But entrepreneurs coming to these pitches find it very difficult. 
for governments, we have to see how to uh, relaunch economies. We need ideas which will develop. In Benin, we ask ourselves a question. Could we put in place a fund to support entrepreneurship in the digital area? That could be a solution. We have NGOs that are putting forward this idea, trying to convince financing sources to have some support. But governments themselves need to also get involved in relaunching economic growth. It's also a development issue. So how can we go about this? Do we go to the African Development Bank or other banks with a project for a fund to support entrepreneurship? That could be a solution. That's an idea that I put to the panel. I'd like to ask them what other approaches they could suggest so that can really overcome these issues. Thank you. Merci, Jose. So let me get a couple of questions, but you, they need to be questions, not long comments. Otherwise, we will not be able to because we have another session to go into. So please. Thank you. I think when we talk about access to finance, it's also for us uh, as entrepreneurs to know who to talk to as a lender at which stage of development. Because some of the lenders, they will ask you to reach a certain number of customers to be accepted for funding. And to reach the number of customers required, you need money for it. It becomes like a chicken and eggs. Is there anyhow there should be a platform to know which lender to talk to at which stage of development of a startup. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody from the very back? Uh, someone who has not asked a question before? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, hello, can you guys hear me? Um, my name is uh, Bram Ayu. I work for ET. ET is, uh, I'm not here to pitch, but uh, ET is uh, uh, we offer advisory services to governments and the development partners on their programs in Kenya. My, um, my question is directed to the World Bank, Mr. Kelly, and uh, EIB, because I noticed that the kind of, the kind of uh, uh, clients that you are funding are actually uh, well-established institutions like telecoms and so on and so forth. I was wondering we have, whether you have programs to actually fund just regular startups uh, who are actually venturing into the tech space. And then the other question that I do have is uh, what kind of programs do you guys have in place in order to ensure that uh, you're covered from a risk perspective, in order to ensure that the funds that you are investing in the techpreneurs uh, have, a, have a return on value on your end? Uh, that's my question. Good questions. Let me uh, now turn to our panel. So who would want to go first? Yeah, Catherine, okay. So Catherine, also I have a question for you. I also would like to know what can EIB do more to bring non-African investors to Africa? Okay, thank you. Um, I think one point I'd, I'll, I'll need to clear. I mean, because of, of the type of institution and the nature of institution uh, that EIB is, uh, there is an issue of ticket size. Let's, let's be clear on this one. So we are not able, because of our structure and, and the way we operate, to provide direct funding to a small entrepreneur. I mean, I think that that has to be uh, very clear. I mean, we, we are not the right institution for that. But the way we do to try and, out, and reach out to the small entrepreneurs is in an indirect manner, and like, you know, a lot of, of DFIs actually, by providing funding either to commercial banks um, that then will be able, or at least will have the long-term resources that will enable them to reach out to small entrepreneurs, 
that doesn't fully cover the risk because they are taking the risk on the small entrepreneurs. So, I mean, that, that remains to be tackled with. But at least they cannot claim that they don't have the resources because very often they will say we don't have long-term funding available because this is the nature of the financial markets here. Uh, so at least, and we can also do that by providing local currency, which is another issue. I mean, the, 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 the currency, the funding currency and the forex risk that is uh, enshrined in that. Then we can put in place on the side, as I mentioned earlier, a kind of a technical assistance, which is ground funded, whereby we will help in terms of capacity building and, and, and uh, reaching out to both banks and, and entrepreneurs. So it's all indirect. And the other way is to invest in funds like TLCOM timed, who will then in turn, uh, first of all, they have the market knowledge, as Andreata said, I mean, they live in the market, so they are the best place to identify uh, the, the deal flow and, and, and pick up those that have the real potential. So we do that in an indirect manner. Um, so th that's the, the first point. So I mean, so very often we have small entrepreneurs knocking on our door. Unfortunately, we cannot help them directly. We have to redirect them to either banks with whom we are working or uh, funds. And, and very often when it's small entrepreneurs and innovative and startups, we will direct them to some of our impact funds uh, that, that really have as an objective to provide the, 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 the seed funding that these entrepreneurs will need. Thereafter, once they grow, and we are starting to have example uh, of uh, entrepreneurs who have been funded through some of the funds. One of them is well known here in Kenya, it's Delight. Uh, Delight was uh, supported by one of the funds in which we are invested. And earlier this year, we were able to give a corporate loans to Delight. Uh, so, that is, you know, a kind of a, a nice way to help them indirectly first, and then they can become direct clients of ours. So I think um, that's what I would say in, in terms of, of how EIB can help. Uh, there is so much we can do, and one has to be realistic. I mean, we, there are, and, and I agree with you that there is an issue of knowing where, where to go and where to get uh, the money from. And then uh, I will respond to Ma soeur, because je suis née au Congo, donc... Oh, my sister, I'm born in Congo, so I'll answer your question in French. And uh, I was very happy to be called uh, Madame Catherine. Interoperability. And I think there what I would like to point is that the government has a role to play. I mean, we did mention it on a few occasions, but the private sector alone will not be able to make it all. There has to be, a, uh, there is to be an, a policy, an enabling policy, and that's the role of the government. And that's maybe where larger institutions, and I mean, EIB doesn't, does not do so much policy, but I mean, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the European Union, they have a leverage there to go and speak at the highest level and, and try and push and leverage that policies are being put in place that will thereafter, uh, you know, help out. I think Kenya is a good example where interoperability is is coming, is coming up now. And I will stop here because I know Francois wants to say something on that topic, so I don't want to cover his topic. Thank you. Before I go to Francois, let me turn to Tim because there was a question to Tim directly. Tim, please. Yeah, I think uh, the question related to uh, the size of, uh, of loans and the, and the kinds of uh, customers that the World Bank can, uh, can, can, can work with. Um, uh, realistically, the IBRD part of the World Bank Group only deals with governments and our friends at the uh, IFC, um, they won't get out of bed for an investment of less than $10 million. So we, we do have a difficulty in reaching out to, uh, to smaller um, borrowers. Uh, and the way we do that is by working with intermediaries. So a good example uh, is the work that we do at the Climate Technology Center, which is based here at Strathmore University. That's a $15 million uh, grant in total, of which $9 million went for setting up the center and uh, the staffing, etc. And then a, a further $6 million went to a revolving fund, uh, which is used to invest directly in the um, 
the entrepreneurs and the startups that are resident at the CTC. So by working with uh, um, intermediaries and working with funds, um, such as those um, represented on this program, we are, we are able to, to reach the, um, the, the end users, as it were. Thank you. Thank you very much. Francois, very briefly, please. Thank you. Je, je fais très brief. Very brief. Concerning interoperability. Well, an important point. Mobile telephone operators who launch mobile money services, well, they are entering a new business. What is important for them is to generate volume and to demonstrate that it's profitable. And what one sees, based on the experience of certain countries, is that once it becomes profitable, one can sit all the different mobile operators around the same table and then one can try and develop links between them because it will lead to more transactions. It's a win-win situation and this is exactly what happened in Tanzania where Citigo and Airtel sat down around a table and little by little moved towards complete interoperability. And I would recommend that you should read the latest uh, agreement between NTM and Orange, uh, Mowali. It's mobile money, uh, well, how does one call this? Um, it's a mobile money switch, which was uh, done by both companies. And uh, at a global level, they, want, they would like to see all mobile money operators use this switch to ensure interoperability. Of course, I can give you more detail regarding this if you're interested, but um, turning to Benin, <coughs> it was the gentleman sitting there, yes. Now, the role of the government in innovation, I think, is key. We work in countries such as Malaysia, where from the point of view uh, of innovation, things are not that developed. The government in Malaysia, for example, developed uh, a department on the digital economy which provides a gamut of services aimed at developing innovation in the country at a greater pace. Acceleration, investment funds and so forth. I think that the government now has a key role to play there. And uh, what I would propose, and we of course can have a, a discussion on the margins of this meeting because we're quite active in Benin and it would be very interesting for me to be able to share more detail with you. Francois, uh there was a question on E-Trade for All, so let me uh, invite my colleague, uh, Toby and Fredrickson, who uh, leads the program to answer that question. Toby, and you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Fernand, for bringing up the E-Trade for All initiative. And I, I also want to come in here simply because we are about to have the UN Capital Development Fund as our 31st member of E-Trade for All. Uh, and uh, I cannot really answer your question as to whether one could set up a fund or so. That's uh, beyond my, my uh, competence, but the other people here are more um, uh, equipped to do that. But what I think is coming out from listening to the various panelists here is that it, the question of financing is just part of the picture, even if you're really focusing on financing. You have the skills, you have the policy regulation, you have the connectivity and so on and so forth, tech hubs and so on. So what I think would be perhaps worthwhile considering is that we, who are members of E-Trade for All, we have UNCDF, we have the African Development Bank, we have the World Bank, and who knows, we might even have the European Investment Bank at one stage. That was an open invitation. Uh, and we have UNCTAD, and we bring different types of expertise, different types of interactions with our uh, member states. Uh, and uh, it may be worthwhile looking at how we can work together to perhaps to address some of the issues. I know, for instance, or I, know, I don't know, I understand that uh, the African Development Bank may be focusing a lot on the infrastructure side uh, as such, but maybe not as much on the capacity building technical assistance area, but others are doing that. And I think, for instance, in these uh, recent rapid e-trade readiness assessment studies that we have undertaken now in partnership with other e-trade for all partners, we are covering a lot of the ground in this area for many LDCs in Africa. Uh, and I think uh, also what I hear from you is that information asymmetry seems to be an issue here. Uh, even if there are all these barriers, maybe there are still unnecessarily negative investor perceptions on investing in Africa. And here, that's why maybe, uh, I mean, even if the EIB cannot invest directly, you have an amazing network in Europe 
So maybe it's something to explore whether we can bring some of you as key stakeholders here to Europe, to maybe the e-commerce week that we're organizing in April, to have a more uh, uh, dedicated discussion to how to reach out to those investors that could be interested potentially in getting more involved, learning more about it, perhaps addressing some of the asymmetries that we have. Thank you, Toby. And so we are now coming, kind of we are now in, in the concluding sessions. And in fact, we were supposed to be now talking about what the policymakers should do, and but we heard what the policymakers need to do across the, across the board. The discussion was that, the, the whole point of having an enabling environment, the infrastructure, hard infrastructure, soft infrastructure like skills, regulatory frameworks, and creating a safe space, basically, for the investments to, investors to come in. There's a big role for the, for the governments to uh, do. Uh, I, we heard from the panelists very clearly, private sector cannot do this alone. So we have these messages. So at this, in this last session, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to summarize in, you know, about, in about three minutes you know, what are the key takeaways from this session, and especially for the, uh, your messages to governments. So let me start from this corner here, Sam. I think our message to, to governments on this area of uh, how they can best support the development of, of tech businesses is really to follow the advice, you know, the themes that have been laid out today in terms of building capacity, in terms of um, helping both you know, public sector, but, but I think in particular private sector parties to, to collaborate better to, to, to fix, to, to fill the gaps. You know, for example, the use of data again, uh, as a way of, of, of improving the ability of, of, of financiers to, to finance more projects. Um, so I think it's a combination of both sides. Thank you. Tim? Yeah, I guess when we um, think about the, the role of government, the phrase, can elephants dance, uh, comes to mind. Um, uh, and it's clear that uh, our governments are never going to be nearly as, as nimble as the private sector, never nearly as nimble as the, uh, the entrepreneurs that they're seeking to serve. So I think for that reason, governments probably need to, to focus on, on creating uh, a space for entrepreneurship to develop, and both a, a, a virtual space in terms of creating the right in, enabling environment and the right investment conditions, but also uh, sometimes a physical space. In the case of Ghana, uh, where we work through the e-transform program, uh, the government has, uh, has set aside a, a quite a, a big um, a physical space, the Accra Digital City, which is a series of old converted work um, warehouses uh, not so far from the airport, which has become a, an entrepreneurial space within the heart of the city. So, um, yeah, creating a physical space and also creating a virtual space can help. Thank you. Thank you very much, team. Um, from, from my perspective, I think that there's a couple of things. One they, they could, uh, could do is um, just de-risk some, some of this going forward. We've got data regulation coming down the line. We don't know what the rules are. That's a problem. And I think we need to take that as a, 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 as a regional challenge to government to actually resolve that quickly so that people know whether they're risking their money in all the right places. The second thing... Um, is um, we need governments as the biggest player in the economy just to adopt technology. We need them to drive the demand side and change the culture because there's a lot of smartness that's available from local entrepreneurs and it's going unused. So I'd like to see a much, more, a much bigger drive for e-government with a view to actually driving a culture of technology adoption. Thank you. Simon, sir. Um, I think governments could, uh, in addition to what's been said, the governments could uh, support, uh, if, if they really do intend to support the birth of uh, digital entrepreneurs in their own places, research and development is a place that uh, they can do um, support um, early stage companies to explore and find market and, uh, and, 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 and get to a place where they actually are growing so that uh, they can take off from there. Especially if you start talking about things like um, uh, 
tech startups that are in the hardware space and uh, stuff like that, they need, they need a considerable amount of uh, uh, support around research and development. Then you can also look at things like uh, allowing for policy that allows uh, early stage investments to take place and security on, on the risk that, so that uh, it's easy for that to happen. But also recognize that because it's risky, is that is this, is, what's the policy around uh, people who set up shop and then have to close shop and are moving on to the next idea? Uh, not because they've defrauded anybody, but because they've safely realized there's no market opportunity, they need to close out. Uh, can that be simplified so that entrepreneurs can be entrepreneurs, move on, uh, move, on, uh, move on to the next thing? And that includes taxation around are there, are, are, can you create environments that attract, uh, for example, uh, people in the diaspora to come back with skills to come back into the country and benefit from, uh, benefit from uh, a taxation that allows them to set up in the first two, three years and, and, and grow uh, uh, and, and scale out uh, if possible? Yeah. Thank you very much. Andreta? Uh, just to also build on on what's been uh, but what's been said, I think on the policy side, I think um, so in regards to so just having more tax incentives for startups. I think also something also that's specific to startups is around uh, employee stock options. For example, many of them don't have money, so they pay their employees using stock options. But when you look at the tax uh, laws and its impact on the uh, employee stock options, it doesn't. It's not very attractive. I mean, there are instances where you may even pay taxes without receiving any cash payout. So I think we also just need to look at some of the, the laws around that to, to facilitate for a better environment for, for them to operate. Um, I think also another key thing is uh, regional integration, uh, especially for, I mean, I, yeah, I guess all the, the, the different regions because like we've, we've said here, the markets are fairly fragmented. So you really need to be able to move to another market fairly quickly. Um, so that would be quite, uh, quite helpful. Thank you. Amolo? Um, at the level of the micro and small entrepreneur who's trying to participate in the e-commerce world, I think governments can really facilitate access both to uh, finance and also to the e-commerce universe if uh, people have national IDs and business IDs that are easy mm. to obtain. Um, and also that the progression from being an informal to a formal enterprise is, rather than being one big step, is a set of uh, small stages, each of which adds value both to the entrepreneur and to the government, um, so that people can start by being a micro-informal entrepreneur, and as their business grows, they can naturally become more and more formalized until, as a larger entity, they're a fully formal institution. Thank you very much for these uh, very good points from the MSME uh, point of view. Thank you. Francois? Yes. Uh, concerning, I think, one of the role of the government is that in some countries, and I think Tanzania and Sierra Leone, um, I think the government has put what they call regulatory sandbox. And so what is a sandbox? It's a safe place, let's say, to innovate for entrepreneurs in an unregulated uh, area. And I think that's something that I really would like to encourage because I think it's really enable a lot of different companies in an unregulated area to be able to develop. It's a learning from the regulators to better regulate in the future, but also it's a free space really for innovation to be able to grow. But something I would like to warn also on this is that a lot of the sandbox, maybe there is only sand, there is not enough tools to be able to play with the sand. And so that's why I think it's important we discussed the whole day, okay, the, the, this whole morning about, let's say, what the different tools concerning financial supports, concerning open API, concerning access to data, uh, access to skills. So we just need to make sure that this regulatory sandbox is not only a regulatory, it's really a whole sandbox where there is a lot of tools around it that really it's a, a, sa a safe and really powerful place for, for innovators and entrepreneurs to develop. Thank you very much. Catherine, please. Yes, thank you. I think uh, one point we mentioned it was the government needs to make sure that there is adequate infrastructure to enable, so we, they need to promote, enable investment in the infrastructure, both public or private funded, um, so that, that, that they have a role to play. Uh, education and smart education is key as well. 
because I think there was a very interesting case in Andela that uh, Andreata knows probably where uh, an IT developer who had failed on all the exams actually made it greatly uh, when he was uh, trained by, by Andela. So that's why I say it needs to be smart education so that people get the skills that we discussed. And then another important, I've heard men, uh, mentioned of uh, tax benefits and all that. What we have observed is that sometimes investors are going into very aggressive tax jurisdictions which can deny them access to financing at the later stage, especially from an institution like the EAB who is following EU rules. So uh, they need to be educated in terms of what are the be best practices in terms of, of tax uh, as well when, when they set up their company. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let me turn to the audience. So I would like to get your feedback, not just to the government, but also to international organizations like us sitting here, uh, Angtad, uh, especially, uh, as you know, Angtad was created in, I don't know, in 1964, uh, and this is the only organization in the UN created by developing countries, for developing countries, and the, the reason for the creation of Angtad was to help developing countries to integrate into the global markets, and that job is, of course, is undone, and the global uh, in, in the market is increasingly becoming digital. So that if there are any feedback that you would want to give to us that we need to take back to Geneva and to Washington and New York, please. Uh, and here in, uh, here in the region, the, uh, the agencies that are based in the region, and Cote d'Ivoire and uh, Kenya, please, uh, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm Andrew Akelo Omogo. Uh, we run a project called, uh, a program actually called Impact Kenya, and our uh, still young media farm called uh, Olives Media. Um, thank you for giving me the chance to, to give uh, feedback on uh, how far, one, uh, this uh, conference has been carried out, and two, are the efforts that UNCTAD and, uh, and uh, the organizations, various organizations that are involved in this conference so far have uh, helped young entrepreneurs, young techpreneurs uh, get to where they are. Um, of course, the, much, the key issue that has been discussed here, that issue is financing. And for me, uh, one thing that I've learned, I, I, I try to listen instead of contribute more so that I get to understand exactly uh, how do you get started when you go, when you have an idea and you go through this process. What I have understood is that international organizations uh, work with local um, organizations that then give small funding to startups. That is, that is a key point I've gotten out of majority, I mean, uh, some of the conversations that we've had. Uh, that's okay. But imagine a situation where uh, a young entrepreneur has uh, this idea that may actually need direct help from the international organization. I don't know how such a situation may be handled, but it's, it's something to think about. You might, some, some ideas might not necessarily go through the local organizations that you already have, but you could have this idea that you directly want to uh, presented probably before IFC or before IDA, and it could have a potential national, uh, national impact than actually the lab or than the small organization that's already being funded by the international organization. So that is something that is subject, uh, you can think about that going forward. Uh, secondly, um, UNCTAD, a uh, good job. Uh, this uh, Africa e-commerce week has been a, a good opportunity for various uh, stakeholders to meet and exchange ideas and network. So this is something that should continue. Uh, we appreciate that. And going forward, I think beyond the conference, uh, UNCTAD also needs to come up with specific programs to meet these young entrepreneurs alone, apart from such a conference. I mean, such a conference is big. We have those who have already excelled and those who are still young. So it's, the, the mix-up is good. But then there should be a forum specifically for the young entrepreneurs as well to see if uh, they can get uh, help or give you feedback directly on their experience, on their daily experience 
uh, with, with the tech startups. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am Abia David from Burundi. And uh, what I want to say is uh, after hearing the panel and all that you've shared, I think one key thing that we should always remember is inclusion. Inclusion is a very critical thing and if you want to develop uh, e-commerce and all this thing in Africa, we really have to include everyone and let everyone be part of the picture. Because I believe what makes a hand a hand is because you have l l some fingers that are longer than the others and some that are short. So which means uh, we really need to see uh, maybe the World Bank, uh, the Africa Development Bank, all the institutions that are represented in the panel. Let's try and see as much as, yes, there are some big players in the, in the digital economy that are already progressing, but let's not remember the, the small players that are also struggling to come up. Let's try and also try to include them and move together as the whole of Africa. I think with that, it will really help us to develop the goal that we want. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, this is Martin again from Strathmore. Uh, I just wanted to underscore some contributions from Tim Kelly. I'm really glad you underscored the Climate Innovation Center at Strathmore. As we speak, one of our colleagues is in Geneva uh, in ITC's uh, T4SD project that's trying to understand how value chains can enable SMEs to access global markets. You also mentioned IHUB. We had a fantastic session yesterday looking at the ecosystem and startups. Uh, so just building on, I think, the contributions are more made. The one opportunity I think UNCTAD can uh, enable the, not only the country, the region, and the continent, but the globe really make a difference is on um, ensuring access to markets for small players. And I think an ecosystem approach is perfect. Over lunch, I'm, I'm glad Amunga is on the panel. Uh, Eugene uh, is on the panel. Over lunch, I think two days ago, there were a lot of fa fascinating ideas we had, including the World Economic Forum, etc. that unless we had a platform like this, we'd not have been able to explore. So all the big ideas we got from global leaders, uh, UNCTAD just, I think, keep this platform going, especially the online uh, environment. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Lady here, please. Thank you very much. Um, I would like perhaps to recommend that uh, UNCTAD links up with a government of several government institutions and agencies. And then, the, so they give them the requirements of what they can fund, what they're looking for, where the gaps are. And then government goes ahead to mobilize all and maybe put together all the small innovators, including the big ones, so that together they can basically meet that need and be able to foster e-commerce in, in Kenya. So I think each government needs to identify its players and have them registered somewhere so that they are ready for UNCTAD or any other organization that may require uh, or want to fund a, a gap or even build capacity. Yeah, last, you have the last word. Yeah, actually, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> actually, I, I do have a comment uh, based on observations uh, this uh, week uh, in, in, in terms of uh, e-commerce. I look at uh, your image at the back whereby you have uh, the picture of Africa and then we have some circles and all the interconnectivity with it, um, <clears throat> whereby you, you're looking into actually fostering e-commerce uh, within the Africa region. Um, I'm, coming from, I'm coming from a technology background, um, ex-IBM, ex-Accenture, uh, worked in New York, but now I'm in Africa. And uh, technology is the easy part. Uh, basically, in order to actually realize the vision you have on your, on your image, it's possible. I mean, I am able to uh, log into Amazon.com from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm able to actually um, pick up a spare part of, a, of, 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 of something I uh, want. I'm able to actually pay with it via my Visa card, and via DHL, the product can actually be delivered in, 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 in Nairobi within about uh, two, two days. On the converse, basically, I can be able to log into an e-commerce site in Burkina Faso, Rico. Um, I, uh, I can be able to select a product, but I can't be able to do the transaction, complete the transaction. So uh, what's happening is, uh, 
from an e-commerce perspective, uh, in terms of enabling e-commerce in the region, uh, the problem is not with technology. I think the problem is with uh, uh, govern government regulation. The problem is with compliance. The problem is with policy. So basically, um, as, as world leaders, as, as part of the World Bank, as part of INCTAD, as part of EIB, I think uh, you have the platform to actually lobby governments in the region in order to ensure that the, the regulation that they have uh, impeding e-commerce is actually removed because from a, real, from a technology perspective, it, it's, 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 it's actually able, it's possible to actually have uh, e-commerce uh, trade within the Africa uh, region in order to ensure that there's intra-trade uh, across the regions of Africa. That's just my uh, parting shot. Thank you very much. So let me get back to our panelists if they want to have one sentence each or we otherwise we have like three minutes we can close the session. So let me uh, thank all of you. I think this was an extremely important topic, financing for the digital economy and I think we heard uh, constraints, we heard uh, success stories, we heard conditions that needs to be in place to, to, to get uh, startups going and we heard about the tech hubs, the incubators, accelerators and why they would work, why they wouldn't work and uh, you also heard from the international, the banks, the platforms, the, the digital platforms in the region, uh, big capital funds in the region and Amolo brought the perspective for the, the, never to forget the small guy, the, the, the importance of inclusiveness in this, in this space. And I think this was a very good discussion. And please also get to the, as my colleague Tobian mentioned, get to the E-Trade for All platform, you know, uh, log into it, because that's where you can really meet all of us virtually, because we have 31 with the CDF there coming on board. We have 31 international organizations on board. So you can go and see what it, or each organization can do for your needs and get in touch with them directly because that's what the, that, that uh, space is for. Let me invoke something our Secretary General Mukisa Kitui said at the very beginning of this uh, meeting. He said the whole point of us coming to Africa is not to get Alibaba and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the cheap products L coming elsewhere from to the region, but this, the, the whole discussion is to get African products going out to the rest of Africa and African products going out to the rest of, uh, rest of the world. How to build uh, export diversification, how to build, how to create jobs, and how to make sure that Africa thrives. So that was the whole point of this exercise. Uh, just having said that, so let me close this session and please give a big applause to our amazing panelists. and also to the audience that brought very, very good questions. Thank you very much. This session is closed. I thank you. We will have lunch now, and we will then have the closing session at 3 o'clock. So I'll see you all there. Thank